Welcome. If you have yet to find a drink and a seat, please go ahead and do that. And while you, the people in the room do that, thank you for braving the weather out there. Uh, I appreciate those of you, the over 100 of you that are online. I think there's more of you than uh, in the room uh, due to the snow in Denver. I'm Amanda Moore McBride. I'm Dean of the Graduate School of Social Work at the University of Denver and delighted to welcome what I see are familiar faces. We have faculty, staff, and students, but also many community members who have come to multiple of these events. I appreciate your commitment to understanding the social issues of our time and how we can best address them. This series, the Science for Action series, is actually connected to the Social Work Grand Challenges, which my colleague Jeff Jensen will talk in more detail about, but it's really a commitment on the part of social work as a discipline and a profession to say, let's quit calling them problems and let's name some solutions. And in that spirit today, we will begin with kind of a national, even global grand tour of climate change, and then we will move into local responses, looking at environmental justice issues and sustainability, and how Colorado and Denver are addressing these issues at a local level. Level. We understand that online a number of people are holding watch parties at schools of social work around the country and that thrills me to no end. I always like to think about some sort of substantive frame when I introduce our Science for Action series and I thought, should I quote Rachel Carson? Should I do some uh, college, pull up my old college textbooks from Wendell Berry? Uh, should I quote the Lorax? I, I've decided to let the experts handle the real framing and instead give a charge to social work. I call social work the people, we're the people people, right? Guess what? No planet, no people. And often I hear, why does social work care about climate issues? Why should we have a seat at the table? And it's for that reason. We, we see an interconnectedness, we think in systems, and the solutions have to, have to be in that way. So I'm delighted that we have a, a range of experts uh, that are, are more qualified even than the Lorax to speak on these issues uh, today. I do want to say just a little bit about how the Graduate School of Social Work here at the University of Denver is addressing issues of sustainability and climate change and say that uh, my predecessor, James Herbert Williams, really was a visionary in this regard, propping up the first sustainable development and global practice concentration in the School of Social Work that has sustainability and climate change at, at, its, at its focus. And I have to tell you, over the years, we've thought, oh gosh, it's really declining in numbers, and oh, what do we do? And, and now it's, it's, it has doubled in size in the last two years. We have about 40 students here on campus that are pursuing this as their career path. And we're hearing from more and more alums that are out practicing that they wish they had gotten this content and so we're thinking about what certificate options are there for us to offer up to the to the rest of the world and we have the experts here who can do that I'm delighted for the leadership around this event today professor Rachel Forbes who leads our program in Western Colorado and Glenwood Springs deals with issues of sustainability every day uh, she's also uh, a literally hours away from having a baby. So she is not here today, but you will see her fingerprints all over this session. She has major uh, commitment to water rights, but also environmental justice issues that are related to workforce and how workforce can actually influence environment. So that shows up in the session today. I'm also grateful for Professor Sarah Bexell, who in addition to teaching across our curriculum is affiliated with our Institute for Human Animal Connection, which is really pushing not only here at, at DU and in Colorado, but across the world, a conception of One Health, really thinking about the interconnections of environment, animals, and human animals, and what are those points of intersection that can sustain us all. I'm also grateful for Professor Ramona Beltran, who is joining us today uh, to moderate a panel. She interfaces uh, with sustainability rights in an activist kind of way, and always reminding us that the real leaders in this movement are indigenous peoples across the world. So I'm grateful for their leadership. I'm also grateful for those that will join us on the panel this afternoon. And I have a little announcement to make about our keynote speaker. 
I am delighted to say that Professor Lisa Rays Mason is joining us today from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, but by September 1st of this year, she will be on the faculty at the Graduate School of Social Work at the University of Denver. <laughs> She is the global leader in social work and thinking about these issues, and we couldn't be more excited for her leadership here at our school and what comes next for us here at GSSW. So I wanna give us all a charge today. It's not just about learning, it's about action. So all of you are here in different ways, faculty, staff, alum, community members, concerned members of this planet, and I want you to think about what can you take away from today that will turn into action in your lives where we can collectively make a difference. It's my pleasure now to introduce the, the flag bearer for this series, uh, GSSW's very own Professor Jeff Jensen. Um, Jeff is a renowned leader in social work and has really championed, I think, across the faculty in his 20 years here, this commitment to applied research. He leads our nation's uh, journal in social work research and has elevated uh, social work science uh, across the country. We're so grateful for his mentorship of us, and we're really sad to say that he's retiring uh, in June, but we'll give him hell in the meantime. Please join me in welcoming Professor Jeff Jensen. Well, thank you, Amanda, and good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Let's see here. I usually have to do a little adjustment after. And also welcome to you online that are, are listening from uh, around the country. Um, I really want to just take about three or four minutes and to, uh, provide a little context for this series. So this uh, event today is part of a series we dubbed the, the Science for Action series at the School of Social Work. And we've been inviting over the, over the course of the last few years all the leaders of the grand challenges of social work into to uh, offer a speech, offer a plenary about what is going on in their particular field or in their particular grand challenge. And then we pair that with uh, panels of local and regional policymakers, practitioners, um, advocates, researchers um, to, to further explore the issue of the issues embedded in these grand challenges. So that's, that's the broader context I just want to paint for you. Um, and what is the Grand Challenges for Social Work? Well, it was an initiative that was developed by the American Academy of Social Work and Social Welfare back in 2011. Doesn't seem that long ago, but I guess it was. And it was this idea that social work had a lot to bring to the table, has a lot to bring to the table to solve some of our, our nation's, our society's most pressing individual social community uh, level problems. So it was really kind of this broad call for action, if you will, uh, to identify what, are, what the most pressing kinds of problems were that, uh, that are facing our country today, and then set into action through, through, the, through the creation of, of specific grand challenges, various types of action. So these, these, were, these were the original criteria of what is, a, what, is a, what is a grand challenge. And you may have heard this phrase now in, in the last several years, grand challenges, other organizations and foundations have begun to, to use it as well. But the original idea behind the social work grand challenges were, the, were uh, represented here on this slide. There were, a, there were to be a social problem, area or topic that represents a big but achievable goals, things we can, we can get done and, and see progress in within a measurable time period. Um, they were to require collaboration be, with, with and across other disciplines, uh, within social work and across other disciplines. They were to, de to take advantage and use scientific um, evidence and innovation 
um, and generate widespread impact. And finally, the, the idea was that we could measure progress in, in the, the goals that were set forth in each of the grand challenges. So he, here are the 12 grand challenges. I hope you can see those. They're lumped into kind of three different categories of individual and family well-being, stronger social fabric, and creating a just society. And um, there's lots of inf more information about all these things. That's better. All these grant challenges uh, available on the American Academy of Social Work and Social Welfare website. Um, and you can see where uh, today's uh, grant challenges uh, that we're talking about today, the event centered around today, is create social responses to a changing environment. And it falls under the stronger social fabric um, category of the grant challenge. So I hope that just sets you a little context for where, where the event today kind of lands in a national initiative that's aimed at really all kinds of grand challenges that we, that we find uh, facing the country right now. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to our two faculty co-leads and uh, who in turn will introduce our keynote speaker today. And uh, Amanda gave a nice little introduction of our, of our, our co-leads, and I'll just add briefly to that and thank them. Sarah Bexell is, is, uh, is a visiting clinical associate professor in, in, this, in our School of Social Work. She conducts a lot of interesting research and, and public service um, and advocacy work. Um, her research is really on the efficacy of um, humane and sustainable education at various levels of influence. She conducts research and projects in Denver and, and quite interestingly in China where she partners with um, Sichuan University and Chengdu Research Base for Giant Pandas. So it's a kind of a fascinating area that Sarah has and, and uh, I'm sure she'd love to talk to you more about it at the break. She's received um, excellence in teaching awards from our school and earned her PhD in science and conservation and early childhood education from Georgia State University in 2006. So uh, Sarah's going to lead part of this afternoon. Our, our second leader this afternoon is Ramona Beltran, who Amanda also mentioned. Ramona is an associate professor here in the school. And her scholarship focuses on interrupting legacies of historical trauma that affect indigenous communities in particular. And she does this by centering culture, resilience, resistance, healing and art space, and storytelling methods in collaborative knowledge development or production with and for indigenous communities. That's a mouthful, but it's a lot of important work that Ramona is engaged in and has been sharing with us these last uh, years. She, too, has received several awards in the school for excellence in, in teaching and in, in mentoring doctoral students and, and uh, MSW students. So I'd like to invite, um, I think Sarah's gonna come up and, and introduce our keynote, and Ramona, maybe you wanna just, Ramona's right over there, and she'll be involved in, uh, in, in the program just a little bit later, so Sarah, you wanna come up? Hi, everyone. Thanks again for joining us this afternoon. If you're here in person, thanks again. As Amanda mentioned, for braving the weather, and those of you online, um, we'll be including you as we can, especially in the Q&A. We'll be monitoring if you have um, any questions, so please record those as we move through. Just a few brief um, notes on sort of the run of show for today, just to provide you some comfort that there will be breaks. Um, there are more snacks, um, but we, what we will, oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm a little shorter than Jeff. Uh, but we will first have our keynote, um, and I'll introduce um, Dr. Reyes Mason in just a moment. Uh, then we will have Q&A. Then we're going to have a short break. So, um, But if you need a break prior to that, right under that e exit sign right there is uh, our bathroom. So right out there. Uh, then after that, we will reconvene, and we will have our first um, panel session on environmental justice, and then our second session on sustainability. After both of those, there will be Q&A, um, so please be recording um, your questions, and we'll be sure to get to those. So without further ado, we want to hear from our keynote speaker. Uh, and it is my honor to have the chance to introduce her. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, Dr. Lisa Reyes Mason studies climate change and social justice with an emphasis on social vulnerability and inequality. Her work is transdisciplinary and community engaged. She collaborates regularly across disciplines, including engineering, geography, and public health. Dr. Mason's current research includes public interest in green infrastructure, socially responsive stormwater management, access and response to severe weather warnings, and clean energy for all. She also co-edited the book, People and Climate Change, Vulnerability, Adaptation, and Social Justice. And just a little geek out from her fan club, I brought my copy, <laughs> signed and everything, if you wanna check it out. <laughs> Lastly, Dr. Mason has been funded by the National Science Foundation, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. She is a faculty fellow with the University of Tennessee's Howard H. Baker Jr. Center for Public Policy and a national co-lead for the American Academy of Social Work and Social Welfare's Grand Challenge to Create Social Responses to a Changing Environment. Without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Mason. <laughs> Thank you, Eden. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for the introduction and for the invitation to be here with you today. Uh, much of my talk today uh, will be about the bigger picture of social work's response to a changing environment and to environmental injustice. Uh, but I start with these pictures in particular. Um, these are pictures of folks coming together to address social environmental challenges because as I talk about the bigger picture, I'd like to ask each of you, just like Amanda did, um, to think about um, community and what this might look, look like for community where you are, a community that you um, are a part of in some way, whether that's geography where you live, part of your identity, um, maybe it's a community that you work with as a social worker, an educator, um, an engineer, perhaps. Um, so as we go along and I cover this bigger picture, please be thinking about how do these uh, global issues, global trends, um, and ideas that I'll talk about relate to you uh, and to your work. What can you take from today and put into action? So the bigger picture that I'll talk about, um, we'll cover three areas. So environmental justice as social work, the progress of our grand challenge, and then time permitting, because the last time I spoke here, I went over my time, so somebody might have to rein me in again, um, but time permitting some ways forward with this work. So water. Uh, today, about two billion people live in countries that are water stressed, and about three in 10 people don't have access to safe drinking water. Seasonal water shortage during dry periods or drought is also on the rise and an urgent concern. The burden of water insecurity often falls hardest on women and children. Here in this photo, for example, you see children in Laos traveling to a river to collect water for their families. But as we know, water insecurity isn't just a problem that's far away. It's very much a problem here in the US, here in Colorado and with its neighboring states. Um, in rural Appalachia, closer to where I live now, uh, in Colonias, along the US-Mexico border, um, in cities, Flint, Michigan, of course, as we know. Um, these are all areas closer to home uh, that also see significant water insecurity problems every day. Air pollution. Globally, outdoor air pollution is responsible for an estimated three to five million deaths per year. Exposure to outdoor air pollution is associated with higher rates of cancer, cardiovascular disease, asthma, and low birth weight. And in the US, the racial disparities related to pollution and its impacts are grossly unjust. So in 2019, there was a study that found that non-Hispanic non whites were consumed about 17% less pollution than they effectively produce through their consumption of goods and services. But African-Americans in the US 
effectively consumed 56% more outdoor air pollution than what they produce. So a big racial disparity there. And looking at the impact of air pollution early in life, one of the highest risk groups for low birth weight due to air pollution are infants born to black mothers. Climate change, a threat multiplier that is quickly escalating while global greenhouse gas emissions largely remain unabated. Global average surface temperature has already increased by about two degrees Fahrenheit. We see heat waves, wildfires, extreme rainfall patterns increasing. Here in this photo, you see a father carrying his daughter to safety in waters up to his neck after a tropical storm in Haiti. Up to his neck. As you keep looking at the photo, what else do you see? What do you see in the father's eyes? What do you see in the grip of the child's hands holding on? What do you see that's not in the picture? The economic devastation that has likely accompanied this. The trauma that both the father and daughter will experience going forward. And do you see their brown and black skin and ask why? There are so many more statistics, so many more stories of environmental change and its injustice that I could give. For so many people, we are already, li already living in a deeply unequal world. And so the consequences of all these environmental issues are vast, devastating, and unjust. They are food and water insecurity, our most basic fundamental needs to survive. They are physical health impacts, mental health impacts, the latter of which is only more recently being studied in relation to climate change and other problems. Social, the social fabric that we all rely on every day is getting disrupted by environmental issues and financial security, people's income, their savings if they have any, are taking a hit, that basic security. So when we talk about these issues though as problems of environmental injustice or environmental justice, what do we really mean? The US EPA's definition of environmental justice emphasizes the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people in developing and enforcing environmental laws and policies. The EPA also says that all people should enjoy the same degree of protection from environmental hazards and equal access to the environmental decision-making process. So this is a definition with some strengths. It has an emphasis on equality, on protection, on participation. But our own Council on Social Work Education's definition goes a little bit further in two ways. Uh, what you see here is how it talks about not just protection, not just equality, but reducing, it gets closer to talking about actually reducing the threat, reducing environmental and health hazards, and focusing on equity, focusing on um, ensuring that there's not disproportionate impact to people. And then second, it also starts to move beyond a solely human-centered lens to one that respects and values other species, biodiversity, ecosystems. And so in that, our own CSWE moves us closer to what some might call ecological justice, encompassing of environmental justice, but not just focused on being human-centered. So the definition that you just saw was released in 2015, which is also when CSWE, for the very first time, put environmental, environmental justice into uh, social work competencies. So bachelor's programs and master's programs for accreditation are now expected to uh, be addressing environmental justice in their courses. Since then, schools are still grappling with this, many schools, um, and since then, what I wanna talk about is what else the profession has been doing to address this. So CSWE now has a task force. It's actually co-led by Rachel, if she's listening. Um, Rachel is one of the co-leads for that task force that's creating a curriculum guide so that schools who don't have a lot of, a lot of environmental or climate you know, focused social workers can have resources in their hands um, to help infuse this into the curriculum. 
around, also in the last several years, certain codes of ethics of uh, social work uh, in Britain, Australia, for example, have put environmental justice language into their, their national association codes. The International Federation of Social Workers has also produced several environmental resolutions and statements, um, especially related to issues around globalization um, and the rights of indigenous people. And on the right, what you see uh, is a cover of a workbook. It's one of three workbooks that have been produced by IFSW, or published by IFSW, but produced by uh, Michaela Rinkle and Meredith Powers. If you're not familiar with these workbooks, there are three of them now. They are absolute gems. Um, you should please go and download them. They are open access freely available on IFSW's website, and they have uh, contributions from social workers and social work educators all over the globe who are providing case studies, educational materials um, for promoting environmental sustainability with communities. One other thing IFSW has done is that very recently they launched a climate justice program, which for them is a way that people can, in a very straightforward way, go to their website and personally offset your own travel emissions. You, they, you can calculate your travel emissions there, and if you choose to make a donation based on those, it goes directly to climate adaptation projects on the ground that IFSW is connected with. So we've seen some movement. Also in 2015, um, when CSWE first included environmental justice into its competencies is when uh, the American, as Jeff introduced us, laid the groundwork, um, AASWSW, uh, that's, I think 2015 is around the year that the 12 were launched, and so create social responses to a changing environment was chosen as one of these 12. Uh, so what has been the focus and progress of our work? In the seminal paper for our grand challenge, um, my two other co-leads, Susan Kemp and Larry Palinkas, laid out four broad areas for this grand challenge at the time. Disaster preparedness and response, which social work actually has a long, rich, extensive history of working in the disaster space. Also population dislocation. So thinking about the forced or sometimes voluntary migration of people as a result of environmental or climate issues. Sometimes you'll hear this talked about um, in terms of, of people becoming climate refugees or environmental refugees. The third is community-based adaptation. So working closely with communities um, to build resilience, um, to cope with changes that are already here or we know are going to get worse. So helping people adapt to what's on the horizon or already here. And then mitigation, or preventing um, further environmental degradation, and as part of that mitigation, also potentially moving actually into environmental restoration. So these are the four kind of big bucket areas that were laid out um, by Susan and Larry in the Grand Challenge paper. But what I actually want to do is, rather than go into those four, what I want to do is talk about our progress with this Grand Challenge as a whole, and how we have been working to um, pursue deeper disciplinary knowledge, support early career scholars and students in this work, and then bridge sectors, disciplines, and grand challenges. So think about that for a moment while I drink my water. <laughs> I have been, I have, I just is just extra sharing and sharing with all the people online too. I recently, some time ago, learned I have something called vocal cord dysfunction. And so if I stop talking, <laughs> that is what is happening. And just let me drink my water and I'll be okay. Okay, so knowledge. So I'm starting here, knowledge, pursuing deeper disciplinary knowledge. So in comparison with some of the other grand challenges, ours is a relatively younger one when you think about the evidence base for um, our profession on this topic. And so a few years ago, I think unbeknownst to each other at the time, uh, three separate teams started working on reviews of the social work research in this area. Um, in our case, our paper, which is what I'll focus on here, um, we focused on social work research on global environmental change. Um, but the two other teams, and their work is published in international social work, um, the two other teams, one was led by uh, Amy Krings, who's at Loyola, Chicago, and colleagues of hers who were then at the University of Michigan, and then the other one it was led by Sarah Bexell here at DU um, with some of her colleagues. So go check out all three papers. Um, we each use slightly different methods to look at what is the state of social work's knowledge in this area, um, but we largely found that much, much more empirical work is needed. 
And by empirical, I mean, I mean research. I mean all kinds of research. I definitely don't mean empirical to mean quantitative research, um, in case anybody's not sure. I mean just research that's done. Moving beyond now the, the stage of social work needs to get involved, let's get more social workers involved. Yes, we're on board, let's, we're doing that. Like now it's like, let's produce the knowledge and move that knowledge into action. So in the review that my team did, we looked at over 3,000 um, articles that met our initial search, and then with our inclusion criteria, brought it down to 112 articles. Um, and those were, again, articles that were examples of empirical research, um, not just conceptual or call to action pieces, um, that were published either in a social work journal or not in a social work journal, but one of the authors was a social worker. What you see here is the 112 categorized by year. And so you can see the growth you know, through 2015. Half of, almost half of the studies were um, published from 2011 to, to 2015. And this was a, a 30 year period that we were looking at. So we're now in 2020. So if I have any volunteers to like do this again with me, you know, and look at like the 2016 to 2020 um, range, what I, you know, what I, we're gonna see is that it's off the chart. That's what we're gonna see. And that is very exciting that it is gonna be beyond um, what we've seen before. So more and more people are, uh, more and more social workers are thinking about this, writing about it, doing research on it, and then, and then we hope trying to move that research into action. What I show here though, and I know the font is tiny, so I'll, I'll read it for you a little bit, is we classified then those 112 studies into what environmental change topic were the studies looking at. And studies could be classified more than once. What you see at the very bottom is that a third were focused on hurricanes and typhoons. Moving up from there, I'll read a few. About 12% climate change, 11% flooding, 10% energy. Remember, we only had about 112 studies. So when it says 10% 10, 10 energy, that's like 11 studies in a 30 year period. Okay? The hurricanes and typhoons, 33%, so about 40, 45 studies. Why? because social work has this longer, richer history on disaster. That's where so many of these fall. About 50% of the articles in our study were tied to a specific crisis, a specific disaster, a hurricane, a typhoon. Um, there was a, uh, they call it the bushfire devastation in Australia in 2014. Um, and, and this is important work. So I don't make this point to, um, undermine that work, that work is essential, it's necessary, social work is gonna absolutely, because we've got to, the disasters are getting worse and worse, we need to keep working in that space, and we need to do more. We need to also be thinking about so many of these other topics as well, that maybe aren't the ones that are on the news every day, but that are the environmental injustices in our midst. Studies, also, let me go back actually before this. Studies also tended to focus heavily on describing the problem and the human consequences of the problem, which again is really important. This is something, a role for social workers, calling out disparities that is essential and vital in so much of what we do. And we have to go beyond that as well with this work. We, have, we need more studies that are really looking deeply at the underlying causes of these inequities and then moving us towards solutions and interventions as well. So among the, the smaller number of studies that did actually look at some kind of formal response to an environmental challenge, or maybe were a form of intervention research, um, we took the author's own recommendations for practice or policy, and then we categorized them. Um, and so that's what you see here, is the top two or three um, kind of categories of implications that authors made. At the, and we classified them at the micro level and then at the meso or macro level. So for the micro level, when I wanna bring these to life a little by giving you some examples from those studies. So at the micro level, studying bushfire devastation in Australia, um, Hickson and Lehman recommended improved training for social workers on disaster specific trauma, bereavement, and resource disruption. Plummer and co-authors cautious, cautiously, like they were recommending their intervention, but wanted to recommend it cautiously until more research was done on it. Um, use of a psychological first aid intervention for children that they were studying following a disaster. And then studying pastoralists and drought in rural Kenya, Lesorigal stressed how important it is to tailor asset building interventions to 
the participants' own social and cultural context. At the meso or macro level, you can see the two most common categories of implications here. And examples here are that Friedman and Bess, working on a community university food security partnership, recommended that the partners, and really meaning especially the university, in the community university partnership, um, ground itself in participatory approaches, democratic decision making to avoid being so heavily centralized at the university, in the university community partnership. I see some knowing, knowing glances. Um, and then as an example of the second one, Alawia and co-authors concluded from a post-Hurricane Katrina study, um, they recommended that federal disaster policy should incorporate the spiritual and religious needs of survivors. So as we think about new scholarship in this area, so our grand challenge kind of focus and goal of deepening our disciplinary knowledge on this, our team recommended the following, that, we, that new research here diversify topics, not just be post-disaster focused. Again, don't ignore that, but there's so much more to do. Um, continue to call out the crisis and injustice and disparities but also pursue the deeper understanding of structural inequalities underlying these issues, improve study rigor and conduct intervention research, and for all of these, cultivate partnerships, partnerships, partnerships. Um, partnerships, here I say research practice, but I really mean just like partnerships across disciplines, partnerships between um, you know, researchers and community members, research and organizations, um, just partner as much as possible. But even for even further, as we pursue this new scholarship, Susan Kemp, at a recent talk at SWER in January, um, challenge us, challenges us to question the predominant knowledge systems that so many of us are accustomed to. And so I, and this, uh, this probably speaks to, to so across issues, really. Um, and so I share her slide here with her permission. So Susan challenges us to question having um, a tendency to be so binary in our thinking, to question thinking about person and the environment, or human and nature, to question our tendency to think about problems as discrete, and I'll solve this problem, as opposed to problems being interconnected. This is social work, we know like, how interconnected these problems are, but not everybody else sees it. Um, to question being so person and human centered versus being more holistic in how we think about interventions and approaches. To question the privileging of applied approaches without giving special attention to really understanding the underlying social structural inequalities or forces like colonialism or racism or sexism that are underlying some of these problems. And then to question hierarchies of what do we consider science? What is scientifically validated? Is it or is it not? Knowledge that's also local, place-based, indigenous, indigenous. So just a few light points to consider from Susan Kemp, who is always very provocative and inspiring um, anytime I get to hear her talk. I'm really excited about this next section of my talk, I have to tell you, because um, a big part of our grand challenge has been supporting early career scholars and students. Um, I'm still, I mean, I just made tenure like a year ago, so it's not like I'm super you know, far along. Um, but we get, Susan and Larry and I get so many um, requests for support from doctoral students and from early career faculty, and it's really exciting to me that there's just so much interest in this work. And so what I've decided to do next is showcase for you six early career scholars, tell you a little bit about their work, to elevate them, to expose you to them if you're not already familiar with them, so that you can go look up their work, their co-authors work, the community organizations who they partner with, um, to show you what is, is really um, just so exciting amongst our group of early career scholars. And I know there's more of you out there than the six who I reached out to, um, if you're online and watching, so. So I'm gonna start with Shannon Dora Billiard, who will actually be on one of the panels this afternoon zooming in. So Shannon Dora is with the United Homa Nation, um, and she has a, a 
a return, returning to our roots intervention study um, that she is doing with um, young people who are members of the United Homa Nation. Um, her, she has a community-based participatory approach for this study. It's been guided the entire way, over years really, um, by tribal elders. And her driving question with this work is to what extent can land-based healing plus physical activity enhance health for Indigenous people? So if you think back a couple slides ago to, and somebody took a picture, so uh, you could tweet it out and then remind people what it was. The directions for a new scholarship picture um, where I had those categories. So Shannon Dora, if you think about this project, she's really working to conduct that intervention research and in a deeply participatory way. Amy Krings at, the Lo at Loyola University Chicago. Um, Amy's, you know, one of her driving questions is how do members of marginalized communities come together for environmental and social justice? And she has done deep, rich, extensive years worth of partnership work um, on community organizing action and research in Chicago, Detroit, and Flint. And she, with the picture that she sent, um, Amy's words are, these are residents and faith leaders who were protesting for a community benefits agreement to be included as part of the development of a new international bridge crossing that would land in their neighborhood. The community benefits agreement sought to protect the health of residents who would now have to deal with diesel trucks and pollution and fairly compensate those who would be relocated. So Amy's work continues to call out the crisis and injustice of environmental change. Praveen Kumar is at Boston College. Um, Praveen uh, focuses especially on the disproportionate impacts to women and children's health related to um, cooking and, and indoor air pollution from cooking. And so he's working with um, some cutting edge stove use monitoring technology, also doing intervention research to answer the question of what drives not just adoption of clean cooking fuel, but sustained use of it. One thing to like, sure, NGO came in, I have this technology now, sure, I'll use it, yeah. And then NGO leaves, and, and, and for, uh, quite understandably, for so many reasons, which is what Praveen's trying to get at, what are those reasons? People might go back to the, the traditional cooking methods, that the, the sources of fuels they were using before, and therefore not solving their indoor air pollution problem. Um, so Praveen is really using rigorous methods and new technology to do this intervention uh, research to protect women and children. John Mathias is at Florida State University. He's working on a new project to look at why some communities in the rural south are more vulnerable to tornado impacts with higher injuries and fatalities. And I want to describe this picture for you, what John sent me. He said, this is a house in Beauregard, Alabama. Before March 3rd, there was a mobile home where that house stands, and it was in the middle of a forest. After the tornado passed, there was no forest and no home. Now the lady who survived has a new home built by a philanthropic agency. She can hardly say anything about the storm without saying how grateful she is. But the world around her has dramatically changed. There are fewer houses around. It's hard going outside. She remembers too exactly where on her lawn her neighbor's bodies lay. She panics at the littlest gust of wind. So what John is doing is seeking to deeply understand the underlying causes of these inequitable impacts of severe weather in the rural south. Felicia Mitchell at Arizona State University is focused on how tribal members see, their, see the relationship between water and tribal health. Um, she, one of her recent projects looks at uh, used photo voice methods um, to gain participant experiences um, related to water issues on tribal land. And they did a photo voice exhibit of this, um, both on tribal reservation land and um, in agreement and permission of the tribal group at the state capitol to disseminate the work. The quote she sent for this picture is a participant describing the impact of nearby agricultural operations. And she said, so all their chemicals they put on their plants drain right into our water system. I wish they could have did that better. Otherwise, all the chemicals were taken in. 
and Samantha Texera, also at Boston College. Samantha um, has done extensive work looking at how do neighborhood environments affect young people. She also uses very participatory approaches, including photo mapping um, in a public housing community with young people in South Boston. And she and the young people have been very active in making presentations of their work to the city council, the housing authority, and the police department. So she's built these very rich research practice partnerships um, and has made sure that the work gets disseminated for public impact. Um, so those are, that's my trying to call attention to these awesome scholars and the awesome work that they're doing um, and show you how connected to community this work is and needs to be and is being done now in our, in our field. Um, if you haven't come across the recent double issue of the Journal of Community Practice, they had a special double issue on eco-social work. I highly recommend that. You will also see many, some of these names and then many other names of folks also working in the space, including folks in this room. So bridge, not Jeff's bridge project, but the, um, our, our grand challenge has really put an emphasis also on bridging sectors, disciplines, and grand challenges. Why? It's so obvious when to me, who's like working in it every day, that this work has to be bridging. It has to be across disciplines. It has to be in partnership. Um, and one way of doing that is through what we, we call, you know, team science. But Working on team science, whether that's a team of scientists coming together or it's scientists and community, whoever it might be, um, it can be hard. It can be challenging. Uh, and Paul Anurius and Susan Kemp have a recent uh, chapter, which is what this slide is drawn from, where they outline specific competencies for people to build in order to productively participate in team science. Um, and so what I want to do is use uh, some of my own work to kind of bring a little bit of this to life, um, what this team science can look like in this space of our grand challenge. So at the University of Tennessee for the last several years, my work has been um, almost entirely, everything that I've done has been interdisciplinary, most often with a climatologist who's a physical geographer and a water resources engineer. One of the categories that Paula and Susan write about is values. And one of the examples under values of a competency is having an interdisciplinary approach. So John and Kelsey and I met at new faculty orientation. This should say 2013, not 2019. Um, we met at new faculty orientation. It's, it can sound like a story of chance that we met, and certainly there was an element of luck in it, um, but it really was on all three of our parts a mindset and intentionality about from the day we arrived on campus about looking for other collaborators. Um, and so that's part of what I mean by an interdisciplinary approach. I've talked at lunch today with some of the doctoral students about, about not like waiting to be invited to the table. Just go find the table or go make your own table and invite people to it, right? Like there is no reason to, for, to sit around and wait. Just go out and partner on this work, have that mindset. Another one is in the category of habit of mind being non-defensive. Um, so with this example, I'm actually giving credit to John and Kelsey for being non-defensive with the, the story I'll share. So what this slide depicts is, the bottom part of it, um, is the dots and triangles are neighborhoods where we deployed, we were doing a study of urban microclimates in Knoxville. So looking for signatures of an urban heat island effect, um, where temperature might vary between neighborhoods based on the presence of buildings versus green space. Um, we were gonna do some qualitative interviews as well. We were brand new in Knoxville, um, starting to get to know our, our new city and trying to do some, some good work there. So John and Kelsey, as the two hard scientists on the team, for the climate data that they needed with these new sensors that the engineering team had built, thought that they just needed three neighborhoods, three data points for this study. So social worker that I am, I said, okay, well, three, that sounds like a good minimum, I guess, if that's what you need. Let's wait them. Let's pause, we're all new here. Let's go talk to um, nonprofits in the area and folks in, who work with neighborhood associations and city government. Again, I feel like sometimes it's obvious as a social worker like that we should be you know, doing this, slowing things down a little bit. Let's get other people's ideas and feedback on, on what neighborhoods should be included. So that's what we did and therefore everybody was like, why are you leaving out South Knoxville? Duh, you know? 
So, so we put, we included a neighborhood in South Knoxville, and I use this as an example of non-defensiveness because John and Kelsey, you know, they didn't come to the table saying, well, we're the hard scientists, and so we know that we only need these three data points. It was, it was this mutual kind of willingness to hear each other out and build the project together. A third category is knowledge. So, and an example there is other discipline accrual. This slide, um, it's from our NSF project on smart stormwater technology. And so a lot of cities in the US have failing stormwater infrastructure. And this infrastructure is, is the cost of, of replacing it is quite prohibitive, very expensive. But there's new technology now, smart stormwater technology, where you can um, work with the system that's in place, install systems of sensors that are, are continuous 24 hour monitoring data of water flow through the system, um, and install a series of valves and gates, and then have technology that, that based on your data coming in from your sensors, you can um, have the valves and gates opening and closing and diverting water through different parts of the system so that it gets held in parts of the stormwater system, parts of the, the city really, where that are less prone to flooding, for example, and then uh, diverted from parts that might be more prone to flooding. This raises a whole set of social questions <laughs> related to who's gonna get flooded, who's not. Is my, are you telling me that my basketball court is now gonna look like this top picture where if you can see it, it's covered with water. And the idea there is that that, that might be by design. Whose basketball court is that? Which neighborhood? Is it a white neighborhood? Is it a black neighborhood? Why? So there's lots of social questions around smart stormwater technology. Um, and so we have this project that's looking at this. I use this as an example of other discipline accrual because when I got involved in it, I knew nothing about smart stormwater. Sensors, valves, gates, so I had no idea. And so I went to just actively learn about it as part of this collaboration. Humility, willingness to ask questions. Um, part of the techniques uh, uh, with the survey data that we're, we're collecting will be to use agent-based modeling, not a method that I know. So I've gone to YouTube and looked up like agent-based modeling 101. How can I develop my own, um, how can I learn more about my colleagues' disciplines to help us collaboratively do the work together? And then finally, a fourth category they have is interpersonal. So building social and relational skills. And I include here photos from our community-based rain garden project um, in Edward Park, a neighborhood in Knoxville, where we worked with the library and with the neighborhood association and now homeowners to build rain gardens that will also be um, in the bigger scale, if we had large scale adoption of rain gardens, can also help with urban uh, flooding and drainage problems. But I put this for social and relational skills because there's, there's so many different partners to be working with. Um, there's the library staff who have questions about, about this rain garden going in on their property. The neighborhood association going to their meeting and, and just being, being flexible as we all, as social workers around the timing and the agenda and maybe, maybe people didn't show up the night that you were there and so you go back and lots of other moving parts um, that involve those social and relational skills that people so often talk about as soft skills but are like so, so vital to this, to productively working together. So that's what some of this has looked like um, in pursuit of topics related to our grand challenge. And again, I, I drew on these four, but they're really part of a larger set um, that Paula and Susan write about in this chapter. Make a couple points about bridging across grand challenges. So I've contrasted here, um, you know, or put next to each other, the grand challenges for social work and the grand challenges for engineering. And the connections are so clear, you know, how, how these can work in synergy. Uh, so we have Create Social Responses for Changing Environment. There's solar energy, virtual reality, urban infrastructure, clean water, carbon sequestration. And guess what? Those engineering challenges don't just relate to the grand challenge without health leave. They also relate to health, long and productive lives, harnessing technology reducing economic inequality. There is so much potential for this bridging. Sometimes we just need to, to also show people um, that who may, not, who may not know that we're coming to their country. And then within the grand challenges for social work, um, Larry and Susan in particular have been leading up um, a very intentional partnership 
between our grand challenge and the close the health gap grand challenge with Mike Spencer and Karina Walters um, to start to create, it's in the beginning stages, but start to create a very intentional cross challenge collaboration around sustainability and health in the Pacific Rim. And so that's an emerging space for our work. Okay, way forward. Last couple slides. One is that, we, okay, so we're, we're building this knowledge, this disciplinary knowledge. Um, we've been supporting early career scholars and students. Um, we've been bridging to other sectors and disciplines now. What we need to um, continue to, and, and actually step up um, how we influence social work practice. Um, we really need these ES, the CSWE competencies came out a few years ago. Schools are still struggling to figure this out and so it really, we really have work to do in terms of infusing environmental justice or ecological justice across the curriculum. And we need to reach social workers who are already in practice. So there's great potential to offer post MSW trainings, CEUs, maybe through state and local chapters of NASW or other associations. Um, to reach folks who are already in practice. We also need everybody, social worker or not, to identify how this relates and cuts across. So if you are a social worker in the room and you focus more on, on aging, I hope today you've been thinking about already and by the end of today, surely, like what are the connections between the group of people you work most closely with and the kinds of things that I talk about and think about. Um, also preparing social workers for new interprofessional practice. I was saying at dinner last night, often in social work, when we talk about interprofessional practice, what we mean is often a clinical social worker in an integrated healthcare setting where you have you know, a doctor, a nurse, a social worker all on a team together. Vital kind of interprofessional practice. As you can see from my examples, interprofessional practice also looks like a social worker, an engineer, a stormwater chief working together. So we need to prepare people for that. And then we've got youth activists all over the world who are already mobilizing and organizing for bigger change, we can't just let that fall to young people. We need more of us across generations mobilizing and organizing also. Quick practical application of this is if you look up Carrie Dorn's NASW practice perspective, she writes there about, about how um, more clinical social workers can help families um, prepare for extreme weather, provide supportive counseling, and know and provide resources as part of thinking about social work practice on climate change. I probably made this one already the most clear since it's what I do, like the engaging and meaningful research part, but just to emphasize a couple points, how important it is to understand local context deeply, to pursue the disparity research and the underlying causes and potential solutions research, and to plan early for public dissemination of this. And my example here is our book, um, the People in Climate Change book for two reasons. One, I didn't know Sarah was gonna already hold it up and call it out. So if you're talking to a couple hundred people, it doesn't hurt to plug your own book. So that was one reason. Um, but the second reason was really that I believe in, the, in this book so much because I believe in, in the work of the chapter authors. Um, these are authors who have done deep, rich, participatory work uh, in 12 countries. The authors themselves are quite diverse in, in a few ways in terms of gender, their own country, their discipline. Um, they do these deep structural analyses of the problems they're writing about in the book. And then with our editorial nudging, they moved towards some policy recommendations in the book as well. And then finally, uh, policy, impacting policy. This is where it's hard to say, this is like the third point really, which policy changes? Give us the, give us the answer of which policy changes. Context matters so much and in our current administration, it's the local and state policy change that I think really is, is where the potential is, where that matters the most right now is local and state level. Um, so applying impacting policy to climate change, um, possibilities here are uh, looking at local adaptation planning that deeply engages people in that process who are from minoritized groups. Um, a state policy, there are some states that have this, state policy that prevents utility companies from disconnecting clients during life-threatening emergencies. And then pursuing city, state, and national clean and renewable energy mandates. So when I began this talk, I said that I would cover much of the big picture of our grand challenges, scope, and efforts. And indeed, we've talked um, about environmental justice, 
a little bit about ecological justice, uh, questioning knowledge systems, team science and how to get better at it, cross-sector collaboration, um, but I've intentionally come back to that opening slide, the same four pictures. Because again, I wanna ask you now and throughout the afternoon to think about how do these bigger ideas connect to you and your work? What inequities related to this work speak to you? How might you partner with somebody like me um, to protect well-being, to pursue resilience um, for all different kinds of communities in the face of environmental change? Will your work look like the picture on the left, which is a women's cooperative in Guinea, in West Africa, where women are coming together for economic livelihood that also supports biodiversity and prevents soil erosion? Or maybe it'll be the second picture. Maybe you'll organize bike to school events, like this one in San Francisco, promoting at the same time sustainability, physical health, and also social connection. Or maybe you're more of an organizer and a protester, and you'll do intergenerational organizing work, like the third picture from Transition Heathrow. Or maybe you're an engineer or another hard scientist who now is super excited to partner with a social worker on bringing solar power and opportunities for women and girls to rural communities, like the final image on the right. So my call to you is to join us in this grand challenge. There is so much to do. Thank you, Dr. Reyes Mason. Um, I think on behalf of the audience, uh, what you shared with us was so moving, so important and concrete. Um, this call to action, I really feel inspired. And so I wanna turn it over to the audience, both online and present to um, have, a, we have about 10 minutes for Q&A for Dr. Reyes Mason. So if you have any questions, let us know. We're gonna do folks here and then also um, welcome questions online. marginalized communities, folks who are not as engaged with some of the environmental challenges. I've worked in these environmental community activists for years, and I've always looked around the room and go, oh, I'm sorry. Um, look around the room and want to engage more folks in the community. So that's a real you know, passion of mine, and I'm excited to think about how to engage and partner with folks in my community. Um, I'm in Fort Collins, North, Northern Colorado here. And, uh, you know, because that's always bothered me that who's at the table and, and how, to, how to get more folks at the table. So I just really love the inspiration that you've given today on that subject. Thank you. Well, I might comment on your comments, which is um, one place to look is the, the NAACP, um, many of its chapters now have a climate justice, at the national level, NAACP now has a climate justice part of its work. And so there are many local chapters that are now developing that work as well. Um, and then I think your comment, I think also speaks to sometimes, are we coming at it as, uh, with the history of the environmental movement in our country? Um, has it been a historically white, we're focusing on protecting the environment approach? As opposed to, if you, especially if you think about the ecological justice idea, that it's all of us interconnected, um, that that, that is a, is a, and it's not just about protecting the environment, you know, for environment's sake, but that's, that's a driving force as well if we think about it interconnectedly. Um, but also, how does it fit in with all the other everyday pressing urgent needs of people? You know, water, food, utility bills. In Knoxville, it's a common problem that people, um, part of the homelessness um, rate in Knoxville is related to utility disconnection. And so with the changing climate and hotter summers, how does that all go together? So, so it's bringing, I think your point is about bringing people together who maybe always have it. Hi, I um, was at a, a meeting last night at Park Hill uh, a Church and I heard a presentation from five young people under 18 that had done research um, over a six month period, surveys, interviews, looking at the effects of uh, the Suncor refinery here 
in I, arguably the most polluted zip code in the country. And I was quite impressed. Um, I don't know whether anyone has uh, given Greta an honorary PhD yet, but, uh, but my sense is social work somehow needs to be moving to younger ages, interacting with, with people in grade school, middle school. Uh, there's a kind of idealism there, an obvious kind of leadership that's occurring. So I'm really curious to know what, where's the leading edge there? You mentioned it. And what can be done more to really get beyond the sort of ivory walls, the ivory tower, and, and into education at a much at a much younger level? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Two thoughts. Um, okay. Let me. This is where I wish I brought a pen up so I don't forget my thoughts. Um, I, let me see. Ivory tower, and then okay. I think I'll remember my points. So, thank you. <laughs> ivory tower. Ivory Tower, absolutely. I think this, this school of social work, in, in my experience, just um, over several years of following it, is one that really strives to do that. And, um, and to do the research that matters, the research that's partnered, the research that, that thinks way sooner than a journal article is published about what's the actual change. So I think a lot of us who are in the Ivory Tower are still uh, well, I wouldn't want, I'm not going to say a lot of us who are in the ivory tower actually aspire to do that, but there are some of us who really do and feel really strongly about it and I think are trying to, it reminds me of the lunch with the doctoral students, trying to, if you are choosing to be within the ivory tower system by choice, then trying to change it. So I think there are some of us who are trying to do that and I think that that's starting to spread. I think the question of reaching young people, for me what came to mind actually speaks to part of what the grand challenge is, part of what the grand challenges is all about, which is changing what people think about when they hear social work. Because in a lot of my public talks, I still get, or even just meeting new collaborators, people think I'm a counselor, right? A therapist, or, and so I think part of it is, is um, opening more, more minds, of, not moving, but like our, ourselves as a profession, doing an even better job of saying, hey, here are the routes for you. Um, and so I think that reaching out to young people and showing them social work as a possible pathway that isn't only a clinical pathway is one way to think about, about that. I got the two minute warning sign, I think. I think we have time for one more question. Hello. Okay, this works. Uh, my name is Kasim. Uh, I haven't typically been in uh, the educational sciences. I typically do it uh, alone or with some friends or something. And I've looked at social media and the challenges uh, in which uh, to speak to people in general, and a lot of different avenues to do that. And also, uh, There's like a, there's a lot of things that we can actually do at home with, as far as like dealing with like even just something simple with the carbon issue that like I, I really can't get out online. It's, I, it's like the lowest click through rate, view rate, um, just talking about like solutions like that can be banned mm -hmm. from a lot of communities and stuff. Yeah, my, I guess my question more so is like, is there like a potential setup to approach these challenges? Because like, I, I mean, I've, I've done a, a series of research on each social media and how to approach it, but like without a, a team or without um, support, I'm, I'm not able to do it myself. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering if there's any approaches you may know approaches uh, not based on social media well I mean uh, particularly based on social media because you well, know like something goes viral yeah. that yeah. changes the whole community yeah. country or 
yeah. world and potential. Right, so how to use that more strategically for this work. Um, yeah. Okay. And then like, and then in particular too, like with the, there's just a lot of suppressed methods that work. Like for example, growing alga, you can grow alga without even thinking about it. Mm -hmm. You know, something like two to four trees of oxygen mm -hmm. in like 48 hours, mm -hmm. just sitting on your windowsill. Mm -hmm. So that kind of information is not out. I, I mean, I have it all signed, like in a peer-reviewed uh, manner, written down and stuff. But like trying to put that out there, like I have a Patreon that gets like. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's a good question. I, there, there are probably folks who like study how to communicate effectively through social media that might know better than I do. Um, but the, so that so I wish I had the better answers for you. What I was actually thinking of, which may not get to your question, but it's what was coming to mind, was how because there is so much that goes out on social media, and we all get bomb. If you're on it, you can get bombarded really quickly, and you know things have a really even if you get like it goes viral, then it's over the next day. The fact that it went viral, where I actually think we need even more work, and this is I've mentioned her name, you know, maybe on my last visit, but also also today earlier is Catherine Hayhoe, um, who's a climate scientist, uh, uh, talks a lot about how we need to talk about this. We need to talk about it with people every day, you know, and, and make it part of everyday conversation. And if you're talking with somebody who um, is skeptical about climate change, that's okay. Find a way to talk to them about it anyway, in a way that's a conversation. So, so it's kind of maybe more of an and to your, it's not quite the answer to your question, but it's it's some it's a spot where I feel like um, right I tweet stuff too and I'll send things out and something takes off and, so, and a lot of things don't and I need to almost not like just rely on that to share my work too but I need to think too about like how can I just be talking about this more every day with people and make it more part of um, not just the sensational news but um, everyday discussion is what came to mind for me so thank you. Thank you so much for the questions. I know we could just keep going with this dialogue, but we need to take a break. Thank you again so much, Dr. Reyes Mason. If you want to give her a hand again. Thank you. So we'll take a 10 minute break. Please help yourself to the treats in the back and restrooms uh, at various places through down the hall. And we will come back in 10 minutes to um, have our first panel. Welcome back, everybody. Dios en Chaniabu. May you all be blessed. My name is Ramona Beltran. My family is Yaqui and Mexica, originally from uh, northern Mexico on my mother's side, Anglo-European descent on my father's side. I grew up just with my mom, and so that's my cultural standpoint. I'm an indigenous Chicana, uh, mixed race, and I was taught that no matter where I stand, I need to acknowledge my ancestors because it's upon their laps and their shoulders that I am standing. Um, with that, in that spirit, I also want to acknowledge the original people of this land, the Cheyenne and Arapaho people, as well as Apache, Ute, and many of the other indigenous peoples who have called this place their home. It's really important to acknowledge the original people of the land that we're standing on. Um, hi, Shana Dora. <laughs> um, and, and to recognize that this is occupied land. We're on stolen land. And this is in inextricably connected to the issues that we're talking about today, to environmental justice, to climate change, to sustainability. So it's um, my honor to moderate this panel on environmental justice. But before I do that, I wanted to just provide a little context. Um, Shannon Dora, are you there? She was having some technical I am. difficulties. OK, I welcome. Am, yes. <laughs> so, Thank you. <laughs> Yay, Tati, good to see you. Uh, OK. So as I was thinking about this particular topic, environmental justice, as it's inextricably connected to everything else, I was thinking about a quote that was on Twitter um, from a native artist who is a member of the Pyramid Lake Paiute. And his name is Greg Deal, and he's actually local. Um, and he made this Twitter post about a year ago. And he said, today I was asked, what is most important to indigenous people? The land, your language, or your people? I told him, those are all the same things. So I was thinking about what does this mean for us to be, as Dr. Reyes Mason was saying, thinking about 
those connections, transcending those Eurocentric binary ideas that the environment and the people somehow are separate categories. I was thinking about the ways that I talk to my own children, um, the ways that I teach them to be in relationship with the environment. I always say to my, to my little ones and to my son specifically that el agua es la primera medicina, the water is our first medicine. And so he will say this back to me sometimes when I'm just drinking water. That's our first medicine, Mama, right? And so he understands that it's a relative. And he knows that when we visit new territory, new land, and there's a body of water, we go and we greet that water. And we say, thank you, Awa. Thank you for being our first medicine. It's so beautiful to see our children be able to embody that connection versus what many of us have been socialized into, which is the disconnection. And I just want to share one last thing that's from our indigenous tradition. I'm um, a danzante, an indigenous dancer. And we have a dance in my tradition that's called Donansi, which is the, the goddess of the Mother Earth, basically, the spirit of Mother Earth. And in that dance, we actually, our, our movements symbolize the process of photosynthesis. And we acknowledge that science and prayer are the same. So I am so honored today to be talking with people who are, who are doing work that integrate the connections between science and prayer and culture and justice and people and how they really are part of the same thing. So with that, I am just going to uh, really quickly introduce our, our panelists, but I'm going to ask them to give more detail and to introduce themselves in the way that they um, want to do so. So we have with joining us via Zoom uh, Assistant Professor Dr. Shenandora Biliat, who is a member of the United Homa Nation. And we also have Beatriz Soto, who is the Latino Outreach Coordinator for Wilderness Workshop. And then I'm going to let you say the other, because she has many roles, <laughs> which are very important. And then we also have Joe Cordova from Groundwork Denver joining us. So if you all could introduce yourselves, and then I will go into our prepared questions. Cool. Shannon Dora, since you're on uh, Zoom, can you start? Sure. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Ramona uh, and uh, Dr. Jason, for, um, for this uh, wonderful, you know, wonderful talk and your introduction. Um, hello, so my name is Shannon Dora Doria, and I'm the Unfortunately, um, I wish I knew my language, um, but I, I don't. Um, and we're trying to get it back, but that's part of um, the re revival that we're trying to do uh, with, with our tribal community. Was there another part, uh, Ramona, that you wanted to introduce? If you just want to give us maybe a snippet of your, your work. Sure. So I work with United Homa Nation, my tribal nation down on the Gulf Coast, and I study how environmental changes are impacting our health and our culture um, and overall well-being um, through loss of land and repeated and chronic disasters. Hi, my name is Beatriz Soto, and I um, direct the program in the Nuestra Tierra for Wilderness Workshop. Wilderness Workshop is a 53-year-old nonprofit organization that works around the White River National Forest and surrounding public lands. Um, and just a year and a half ago, they started a program um, intentionally um, wanting to involve the Latino community in public land advocacy, public lands knowledge, and just really tapping into the powerful voice of the Latino community on the Western Slope. Um, I am also the Outreach Coordinator and Workforce Development. I um, developed a program to empower um, the Latino community workforce to do sustainable retrofits to buildings and understand building science. My career is actually, I am an architect. Um, so most of my work has been around the built environment and environmental healthy buildings, buildings that are green and sustainable. Uh, my name is Joseph or Joe Cordova. Okay. <laughs> um, my title right now is, is team supervisor. Um, 
change it seasonally. And <laughs> Innovative, yeah. And um, so my title changes seasonally. Right now, um, I am teaching uh, after-school sports camp in Sheridan, Colorado. Um, I work for Groundwork Denver, which is a local nonprofit, and we do uh, community-based organizing. Um, we do everything from growing greenhouses to um, energy audits for low-income families. Um, we do we do um, water quality testing on the Bear Creek. And that testing is done by my youth team, which is the blue team in Sheridan. And um, they collect the samples in the water, send them to the lab at MSU. And we've been testing the Bear Creek for about six years now. And we're just finding the contaminants and um, getting those things changed. We also, sorry, there's so many things I'm trying to figure out what's, what's to touch on. Um, and yeah, so it's just giving communities that are underserved, giving them a voice, giving them a plan and things like that. And for me, has changed my life a lot. I've been able to work with the Park Service, Forest Service, um, anything that has to do in the environment. I've done all of that, and that's through Groundwork Denver. So it gives underserved youth a chance to, to make a difference in their community and wherever they go in the world. Thank you. So to start our questions off, I will, um, I'll just maybe make it a practice to have Shannon Dora go first so, so she can. Um, so the first question is, in your work, how do you see environmental just injustices impacting the communities with whom you work? And as you're answering this question, if you could specifically talk about issues that arise in terms of race, gender, ability, or any of um, you know the salient identity experiences that naturally intersect with environmental justice. Shannon Dora, can you talk about that first? Ramona and everyone, I'm so sorry. Uh, my IT guy is still trying to fix my computer and I only caught the last part of this. Can I just miss off this question uh, or answer before uh, I, I answer? Yes, I'll we'll pass it down the table and then come back to you. <laughs> no problem, we understand. Technology is technology. It's its own relative. Okay. Yeah, um, well, some of the injustices I see is um, one that I can talk about particularly is in the Valeria Swansea um, neighborhood. And um, over there, we're, we're sort of picking up the pieces of injustices that were set before. Um, this is a low, very low income neighborhood, one of the lowest incomes um, near Denver. And a lot of these community members are, they want their voices to be heard, but there's not a lot of platforms for them, especially when all of the power comes from all the industries and all the people who are like, polluting the water and the air and the factories near that area and so we're working in this neighborhood to 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 hear the people out and to, to just come up with any plan to, to get these voices heard and to rebuild this thing and um, in the area where I live Sheridan Colorado there's the Bear Creek which confluences with the South Platte River and all around there there's like the waste management facility uh, concrete recycling metal recycling and all of this is in the small city which is about two square miles and so we deal with this every day and we see it but a lot of people don't have the time, the resources to, to make a change or to even be heard. So that's that's why I'm here and I'm teaching the youths to, to speak for themselves and to, to teach that. So I might be jumping from my multiple um, hats that I wear because they are all interconnected. Um, so the White River National Forest, we think about it, and we think about this beautiful, pristine, clean water, clean air, and you can think there's no environmental justice issues here, this is just perfect. But then if we think about some of the public lands, um, the BLM lands surrounding that, we have a lot of oil and gas and fracking. Um, unfortunately, our more privileged um, parts of society get to live surrounded by the National Forest and get to enjoy it and our less privileged part of our society gets to live next to fracking with low air quality, um, with really bad water quality. Um, and all of these um, sections are interconnected with climate change. And when we ask the Latino community to participate, to write comments, to start to pressure our representatives and senators, they feel disenfranchised and there has to be a lot of education 
um, an empowerment um, around the community for them to be able to start engaging in some of these processes because to administer and to change how public lands are being used is a very, very bureaucratic and complicated system that unfortunately not a lot of us understand how this works. So there's a lot of education and empowerment related with these injustices of which land, who gets the land, why is land preserved, for whom is the land preserved, and which communities get affected by um, fracking. And kind of going into the built environment and going back to these beautiful resort, resort towns, you can imagine it's incredibly expensive to live in these areas and the workforce that are actually running all these towns end up living in homes that are not safe, that are not um, insulated properly, they're not heated properly, and we really try to focus on the, the built environment and where these families are living and making sure that these families have clean indoor air quality. Um, again, it's different types of environmental justices that we see in our community and we work around. Shannon Dora, do you need the question again, or do you? Um, from everyone's answer, what I understand the question to be is how does your work intersect with race? Yeah, that's, that's one aspect of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I, I will speak to that part um, first, and then if there's a part of the question I haven't answered, I'll be happy to fill in. Um, so um, if you've heard my me talk about my research, I talk, you know, at first I start off with the, with the land, and um, Louisiana loses about 35 square miles of land per year. and. Um, majority of that land, 60% of that land loss has been in not only tribal communities, but vulnerable communities. And the state of Louisiana has done this, um, this protection, this master 10 year, 20 year protection plan, and they consistently leave out vulnerable communities. And um, one particular community, or actually one particular grant that the the state of Louisiana applied to for through HUD um, is to remove these vulnerable communities from their land. And, um, and some communities are, are happy to move from these areas, but um, tribal communities are incredibly um, resistant to this because it is, it is the entire life. It is, it is medicine, it is subsistence, it is culture and its family. And, um, and so while this grant was acquired by the state five years ago, we're still fighting it. We're still fighting to be with our relatives and our land. Yeah. yeah, thank you. So building on that, how do you see communities resisting and mobilizing for change? Maybe you could give some examples from your tribe or the tribal communities that you're Sure. Um, a couple of ways is um, uh, one of the panelists mentioned um, about encouraging participation in um, and involvement and having your voice heard. And um, so that is one thing that the tribe has been doing, um, not just for our own um, tribal members, but going around to all of the bayous and all of these vulnerable communities, um, teaching what is an environmental impact statement? Why is it important that we attend these meetings? Um, even though many people feel that that their voices won't be heard, um, this, these, these, um, they're calling them community um, trainings. These community trainings are designed to, um, to uh, resist that urge to stay within our own community and, um, and, and hide from the discrimination that we've we consistently had to um, encourage not only um, voices in um, being heard among the decision makers and being at the table, but having the, dis the um, information that we share be utilized in the decision. So um, that's been a major um, resistance um, that we've been trying to do in the last How is our community resisting, right? Yeah. Um, how are they resisting and how are they mobilizing? Well, I think um, there's a lot of organizing 
happening, a lot of community connections. Um, it's really um, making sure that the people in power are diverse and they have different lived experiences. So people in power at a local level can reflect how they actually, how the community looks, how they think, um, how they operate. Um, a lot of our towns are starting to do climate action plans um, to prepare um, community resilience. And we wanna make sure that everybody's at the table and that the solutions are taking into consideration our entire community and not just one way of thinking and because that will fail if the whole community does not buy into climate action plans and everybody is taking their own personal action and they feel vested into these plans. Otherwise, these plans will fail, especially when we have close to 50% of our community looking African American, looking Latino, looking Native American. Our, our plans will fail if not all community is involved. So really empowering people to step up to these position of, positions of power is one of the key factors that we've really been focusing on. Um, also, um, just resisting injustice is educating yourself. Um, our economy will change. We will see changes in the near future of jobs. And we can't, res we can't just stay stale and not move on to learn new professions. And that's another way to um, just change, make sure your community will, will be resilient um, to the changes that will happen and make sure that our communities will thrive in new economies and in a changing world. I, I second all of that. Um, for me, I, I see it every day in my community. Um, for me, um, I started out, you know, high school student and then now I get to go to city, city council meetings. Um, People look to me for guidance. We have what's called Shared and Rising Together for Equity, which is a board that in my community that I'm part of, where the rec center's involved, um, the city council's involved, the teachers from the school, even the librarians from the local library want to come and see and hear what's about what's going on in our town. That way, if we have anything to offer, we can help, whether it's something small. And it's so hard to, to be resilient because as um, a low-income Latino person or a family, a single mother, you don't have time to go to these meetings. You don't have time to, to know what's going on in your community. You have to go out and work and to get food and to take care of your kids. And so we have communities, we realize that, and we all come together to, to just be more resilient. Even if it's like a small little bit of our time, one small action can lead to so many. Um, one person taught me how to care for the environment and what it means, and now I get to teach that to everyone that I meet. And so I think investing in, in the youth is investing in the future. And, that's something we can all do a little bit of. Yeah, that's great. So I'm gonna throw in a bonus question, which is connected to to this youth, and it was actually a, um, a question that was posed earlier. The youth are really the leaders in environmental justice, and so I'm wondering if you have any examples, aside from what you just mentioned, um, from the various communities with whom you work, that what are the youth doing, and what kinds of leadership are they Probably one of the best examples I can give is um, the youth who work for me on my team. Um, Groundwork started in Sheridan, Colorado, probably when I was a senior, when I was 18, so about five years ago, and uh, I just had the opportunity to learn about them and what they do, and unfortunately I couldn't take the job at the time. I went to the park to do an internship in the Rocky Mountain National Park, and that gave me the basis and the foundation for learning about how to care for the environment. I brought that back home and I came back to my city and I looked around at all the factories and everything. And, and I was like, man, there's so much work to do. And so I've been at it ever since. And now um, the youth that, that work on my team, aside from like cleaning up the rivers and leading volunteer events, they they go to all of the meetings. They Their parents are involved as well. And their younger siblings have something to look forward to. Um, me, myself, I have two younger brothers who get to work for me. and. They're working on taking my position pretty soon, so, <laughs> so good for them. And um, yeah, just just if you if you see someone wh who has the vision and the power, talk to them and motivate them and keep them going because that that one spark can start a fire. I think I still consider myself youth. I'm approaching my 40s, and I remember when I was in school, they told me I was the future and they told me that the planet depended on me. And I still feel like that is my responsibility and I don't wanna throw it to youth.
and I still feel it's all of our responsibility. And I feel like youth feel it a little bit more pressing because they have a longer lifespan, that's what they think. And we're constantly thinking about climate in our future generations. This is here, this is today. We will see the consequences of potentially two billion people having to be climate refugees in the next couple of decades. This is not a future generation. Um, but just kind of going back to youth, um, we have put together um, groups of youth that will sue the BLM because they do not take into consideration climate change when they give oil and gas leases. So we are providing youth the tools and the knowledge based on our experience and our knowledge so they can begin to take action and they feel empowered and that they feel that you know they just don't have to freak out about it but they actually there's an action they can take and we will help them as much as we can so they can do that as well and elevate their voices um, but this has to be all together it has to be all of us it has to be intergenerational it has to be multiple cohorts and really yes Shannon Dora do you want to add to that Sure. Um, one of the really cool things that's been happening is um, these uh, language um, camps have um, re re uh, started, um, and they're mostly geared towards youth. Um, I also kind of consider myself a youth, um, so but I am well over forty, and so um, I do feel like I it's still my responsibility to continue um, to continue with all the rigor that uh, we expect for. Our, for our youth. Um, uh, so our language camps are um, not only just learning language, but in as you so eloquently stated, Ramona, uh, language provides the, the conduit for, uh, for expressing and understanding culture. And that um, culture is all about, under, about the environment. And so um, as the, these mostly teens um, emerge from these camps, they're more invigorated to um, participate in some of our community meetings because they see a better connection with the more language that they learn um, to, um, and a more, um, not only connection to the land, but also a greater um, motivation to, to doing, to adapting to climate change, to stopping a lot of the you know, we see firsthand in, in Louisiana as well, the oil field um, destruction. And so um, trying to stop those activities uh, before they even um, start. Thank you. That's actually really good segue into the next question, which is um, from your standpoint, what opportunities for action and advocacy do you see that more of us can support? So if we're thinking about for lack of better words, allies, or those of us who are maybe not in those specific communities, or um, maybe how we can um, support that intergenerational kind of movement. What are some things that we can do as supporters and allies? Do you want to start, Shannon Dora? Um, are you saying those of us who are, are those, um, anyone who's not doing this kind of work as, a, and so how can they be allies? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, I'm, just, I'm looking around at our audience here, and I'm just mm -hmm. thinking we're from multiple communities, but mm -hmm. I see for the people that are here that we're really committed to environmental justice and to um, stopping climate change. So mm -hmm. what can people who are maybe not in your, in your tribe or in your state, do to support the efforts that you all have undertaken? Um, so first off, um, vote, vote, vote. Um, you have to go out and vote um, and get the people who elected who, um, who, are, under, who understand and not only just understand climate change, but, all, but want to address it. Um, and then the second part I think um, is, is uh, it's consumption. Um, I'm just going to name it. It's consumption. Like the, the less we have demand, uh, the less demand we create for um, for commodities, uh, the less um, 
oil and gas and natural resources um, will be supplied. Yeah, that's excellent. Because I think that both of those are really good examples. Um, if folks, I, I saw some folks say they couldn't hear what she was saying. So the first point she made was vote. And then she reiterated, vote, <laughs> vote. <laughs> so I second that. Um, and then she said also to really consider consumption and, and basically reduce consumption. Because that might not seem like it's connected to Louisiana and the oil spill, but what we consume is totally connected to the production of oil and all of these kind of mini inextricable sort of pathways that all of these things are connected to. So thinking about reducing our consumption. Thank you. Um, I can go. Yeah. <laughs> um, I second that vote. But one thing that also hits home for me is to, to run. Like if, if you're a person of, who has a voice, why not? It's, for me, it's about when opportunity meets preparation. So if there's a spot on city council, you know who's gonna be first? And if it's not me, I know 10 other Latino colored people yes. who will, right? And so, so just, just things like that. Any, anything you have to resource to, to share resources with each other is what I've seen the most effective. Um, time, money, anything that you have to offer, but the most valuable one that I've seen is, is just knowledge and experience. That's something that you can't just give right away. That's something that takes time. And so everyone here has something to offer in one way or another, and it's just a matter of sharing that. Like, There's no use of keeping it bottled up. <laughs> you know, It can do so much more work out there, and you know, all you have to do is listen and talk and, and just keep sharing, and we have to share. It's, it's not about equality. It's more about equity. Some places need more help than others, and it's up to us to, to see that and to, to intervene and do our best to, to see change. These will be great answers. <laughs> I back absolutely um, all of them. But I would just you know say, based on what Lisa said, you can see the numbers of who um, produces more um, CO2 and who is affected by the effects of climate change. It's very disproportionate. Um, and to be in all honesty, being in this country and part of this society, we are one of the maximum producers of CO2 and consumers. Accountability. I mean, let's look at ourselves in the mirror and let's say, you know, I am a part of this problem. What can I do to make it better? Let's be accountable. Yes, it's great to be comfortable, but I also feel like we should be in positions of leadership and we should start to make sacrifices and to just you know, demonstrate to the world that we are capable of caring for others. And if that means how I live my own life, that is a big action. So I would um, add to that as well, your point about um, comfort is really well taken. Um, I think it's, it's something that we talk a lot about here in the School of Social Work. How are we aligning our actions with our words and our values? And if we are really truly thinking about what does it mean to do a land acknowledgement and to understand the inextricable connections between land and people, how are we living into that toward interrupting the, the disparities that exist? How are we living in alignment with our words and our values? And part of that question really needs to be, what am I willing to give up? What resources am I willing to give? And I think for, um, for white folks and people who consider them allies, consider themselves allies, how are you willing to stand in the front line to protect the folks who are typically targeted when we are standing up for these injustices or against these injustices? And so I, I just wanted to add that point too because that actually comes from my community as well. We're really asking put your bodies and your um, resources toward the cause. So um, transitioning into hope stories as our final question, um, I'm wondering if all of you can share a story of hope or optimism that comes from the communities within the work. Can you start with this? Um, so something I heard, I was in um, Washington, D.C., lobbying with Latinos for um, climate, for clean air, for clean water, 
um, and empowering uh, the Latino voice in, in DC. And I heard environmental justice is a civil rights fight of our time. And that is a reality and something that gives me a lot of hope and is a great story is that Congress and the Senate is the most diverse it's ever been in the history of this country. And we can see change, we're not quite there yet and there's a lot of work to be done, but I just feel like we're in such a good path regardless of so many like negative political stuff, we're still in the best point in history. And I can only see us as humanity going forward. And um, our communities are starting to feel it. I see a lot of diverse voices um, rising and people participating. And we all care about this one thing that we have in common as humanity. So this really gives me a lot of optimism. And I think that is the best way to fight anything is just optimism, good attitude. <laughs> Shannon awesome. Dora, can, can you respond? Sure. Um, so I had the privilege to attend a National Congress um, for American Indians, so NCAI, this past year um, on the Climate Action Task Force. And um, one by one, every single tribal leader stood up and said, you know, these are the changes that we're experiencing in our community. These are the things that we're doing. But we've been here. We've been, we've survived genocide. We've survived all of these things. We're going to continue to survive. Um, and so to see all of the tribal leaders come together in that way, um, that gave me hope um, that um, even if our larger federal government isn't doing something about it, that I know that our tribal communities will continue to. Um, uh, to, to take action and to fight. I'm trying to decide which story to tell. There's so many. Um, I figure the one that I'm best with is the power of personal narrative. Um, it's the story of resiliency for myself, which is the story that I can speak best of. And it's just overcoming any obstacles. Um, I grew up with a single mother, low income, housing, um, going to schools all the time, switching schools, and I was like in foster care for a long time. I, I've seen walks of life through many different aspects. I lived with white families, Latino families, group homes, things like that. So I got to see a lot of that at an early age and sort of uh, just kind of beat down on me for a while. And then once I realized that I have the power to make my life what I want it to be, and now I'm just, just on a roll. I'm learning so much about myself and how I affect the world. Um, it's easy to feel like you're just a small piece of a grand ocean, but in reality, those those things are what make the biggest change. And so for me, um, my story is just making change in my community, for my family, and that just keeps making waves everywhere I go. And so that's my story. Yay. Personal narrative, the power of story. Yes, yes, yes. And the absolute just resilience and resistance that is just embedded in our communities, I think, is part of that optimism that we have that we just embody. Yeah, go, going through all these things that many people do every day, many, many different things, it's, you would think that it would make someone want to give up, but it only makes us stronger and it just, it makes us keep going. And that's why we're all here today is to keep that going. So we have a little bit of time now for some questions from the audience, online or present. Can you hear me? Okay. When I work as an accomplice in Native and Black communities, Elders are very much part of the conversations and the activism, and they're listened to. I certainly don't see that in white communities. Um, not only have many of us been involved in climate, civil rights, and other activism, but have lifetimes of experiences and stories. What are you doing to reach out to elders? I didn't hear anything spoken about elders in any of these conversations. 
Shannon Dora, do you want to start with that? Did you hear the question? I did. Um, thank you very much for asking that question. Um, very important part, um, point. Um, so I'm not sure if you guys hear about um, the project that I said Toby saw. I, I missed the first part of her, her talk. Um, but one of the projects that we've been doing is um, is like making the intergenerational um, connection um, with elders and youth. Um, it's an adaptation um, project where we um, started off with elders um, retracing our forced migration routes from where we were at contact to where we are in the Gulf Coast. And um, along the way, we did ceremony um, and we talked about um, many of the topics that are in the communities and um, and at the end of the journey our elders said we like this project but we would rather if um, the youth took the, the physical journey and we were we were um, at, at home and got to process it with it with them whenever they came back so um, this is just one of the you are, I'm sorry, one of the many examples that are happening um, with elders. And we also have a cultural affairs um, project where we are um, archiving, all, we're archiving with pictures and stories um, because we have so many elders who are, um, who are transitioning to their next phase. Um, their spirits going, you know, in other places. So we are trying to, as much as possible, capture their stories and learn from them. Um, so I don't think that it's it's enough, but these are just projects that we're that are going on right now. Does anyone want to respond to that? Yeah, I, I was actually just that. <laughs> um, for for me, it's just um, so every Valentine's Day, I take out my grandma for a date because she's a single grandma and she raised me. But um, when I spend that time with her, I just listen to all her stories of the struggles that she had growing up. Um, like I realize all the things that I have and she tells me like when she was younger, when Denver was all farmland, like that meat they had like once a week if they were lucky. So, you know, just learning how to, to appreciate things more from, from that perspective and learning from the things because uh, I like how a lot of us said that we're still, that they still feel like youth even though they're a little bit older, because in, in Mother Earth's eyes, we are, we are as young as we can be. We're still in an infancy in her eyes. And so we can all still do work. So for us, we have volunteer events where all we have a lot of um, uh, volunteers who are older who come out and help us. And it's getting everyone involved, like we said before. It's, it, it's good to focus on the youth, but without everyone, we can't get to our goals, because you know, it's, we, we need that experience. We need that passion and that drive. And um, one other thing I would like to point out is that uh, I went to Alabama a couple weeks ago for, for work, working at the Carver Museum, George Washington Carver Museum. I went to see the, the historic sites and the marches and Martin Luther King, and that wasn't that long ago. Um, if you can imagine the people who were oppressing them and imagine, I hear the stories from my grandma, what it was like to grow up um, looked down upon and having to work for minimal day and um, that's not that long ago that's one generation so if that trouble has been passed down from me to her you can only imagine what's been passed down on the other side and so we have to recognize that and recognize that everything is still happening like you said this is all right now and we have to keep going yeah I would um, just kind of add really quickly that um, in our community, um, the elders are also really um, the ones that are, have the time and have learned how to, you know, call your representative every single day, write letters. They are the ones that are constantly pushing our politicians more than youth. And I very much appreciate that some of our elders have taken the time to teach us to sit down and to make sure that we are using the systems, how they are set up, and that knowledge is being passed on. So we do team up with very active um, elders in our communities um, to rely on them and to help support us in those efforts. Thank you for that question, Anna. 
the reminder to acknowledge the elders as well. Um, I realize for myself, just as an indigenous person, when I say community, I mean all of us, and that that means elders, adults, or whatever the you know developmental stages are, because we don't actually break ourselves up like that when we're working in community. We do hold the elders in the highest esteem, and we don't actually take any action without their guidance and approval. And it is something that I'm really proud about for our culture, is that we center elders' knowledge, leadership, and guidance in all that we do. And that we are always all together. So when I'm at our, our dance uh, rehearsals or ceremonies, the babies are running around the altar as the teenagers are, you know, maybe off with their phones, and we don't want them to be with their phones. But, you know, that's what they're doing, but they're there. And we're all there interacting together. But that is a really important reminder that we actually can't do this work without this intergenerational approach to it, really, that we are all together as relatives trying to move these issues forward. Other questions? All right, I'm gonna play the devil advocate here. Everyone continue to say vote, vote, vote. However, by the last 200 years, or maybe less, we've all been voting for the lesser of the two evils. And basically, we get the crumbs. The higher echelons get all the cake, the pies, they get their dinner. We get what fall under the table if we can get there before the dog or the cat get there. I submit that somewhere along the line, we're gonna have to do a vote stoppage. We don't want any of the above to let them know that we really do want a change. But the way it's going now is, hey, we're gonna vote for this one because he or she promised this. And we know no one person or two people is gonna get in there and change that establishment. We have congressmen that has been spending half of their lives making sure that you stay in the position that you stay in. So somewhere along the line, we got to realize that the vote is really not working for us, not that it cannot work for us, that we need to get stopped going with the people who's uh, uh, in our face saying vote for us. And most of them are millionaire billionaires and who they associate with, millionaire billionaires that has no type of identity with the rest of the uh, population on the planet. I think you're absolutely right, and I congratulate you. you. You hit it right on, and I think that's why a lot of our population doesn't vote, because people aren't happy with the voting options that are out there. I mean, on a local level, I mean, that's what's kind of great about our political system, in a way, is that local has, there's a lot of power at a local level. There's a lot of power in committees. There's a lot of power in PNZs. There's a lot of power in commissioning. There's a lot of power. and at a local level, we're working at that point to elevate those people to those positions. So while the system is rigged against us, and I absolutely agree with you, we can also use the system to favor us, and we have to understand how it works, and we have to start to put those people in positions of power, and we have to be politically active to make these changes. If we are just anarchists and we just don't believe in it, and we understand that the system has been favorable for all peoples, we still need to keep participating and we need to push those barriers and we need to make those changes. Is it gonna abolish our government? I don't think that's a possibility. We just have to be as active as possible and what we do is just try to empower every single person to be in these positions and to understand that they do have power and to make sure that we are elevating those voices and making sure that the community will support these people to make those changes and that we are united when we need to be united on certain issues, on certain fronts, to back up certain people, make sure we're there and we are following through and not just throwing a whole bunch of people to candidacy and then we're not there to vote for them, we're not there to you know, just be, back there, be, in, be on their backs. So it, we have to be politically engaged. So I want to thank you for that reflection and I think you're right system is a big problem and it's one of those yes and like your response demonstrates and it's so complicated and I, I don't want to shut the conversation down and I saw the five-minute warning 
So I, I want to encourage us, though, to have these conversations amongst ourselves because I think they're complicated, and I think they, they really deserve face-to-face -face interactions, not just what we see in social media or online or in comment sections. Oh, my gosh, the comment sections. <laughs> But I, I, I honor your reflection and thank you for it because it's something we need to talk about. Frankly, it's something we need to talk about. Indigenous people are talking about it. I saw an elder post uh, about, if folks don't know what's happening in BC with Wet'suwet'en people, um, the government is again moving in on tribal territory and unceded land and the system doesn't stop it. So it's uh, something I hope that we can continue to talk about, but I want to make room for the last conversation, the last question and any further um, online questions that we may have before we wrap up. Uh, thank you. Thank is this coming yeah. through? Okay. Thank you for your, your participation today. It's really, really awesome. And thank, you. and thank you for the last comment. I guess my question is, I, I, uh, this year I, I have a, a daughter who has decided to work in Guatemala as a, as a human rights accompanier. And as I've been following her work, one of the things that's clear is how dangerous it is for uh, environmental activists and persons trying to protect indigenous communities in these areas. Uh, you know, it's probably been the most single deadly year for those individuals. Um, and as she's t been teaching me about this um, phenomenon of invisibilizing people um, I've won I wondered how that happens in our own immediate communities and what ways do we see that happening here so I was wondering if you could speak to ways in which our dominant kind of society might engage in that and, and, and other ways that we can come alongside uh, these communities to um, to help ensure that they're not invisibilized yeah um I think from if I'm understanding it correctly, I would say from from those people that you're referring to is to to just pay attention and recognize and to to be willing to stand up and say no against the majority, even though at some point you know you might have been part of that or something like um, just like the Freedom Riders, they had um, a, a young white male student who was the first off of the bus and because he wasn't afraid to fight with, for what he believed in and he essentially took the worst of of the beating of that and everyone has to make sacrifices at some point and some people have to make sacrifices their whole life and we just have to be willing to stand up for, for what we say and to say no and um, for me it's all about focusing in your community um, I've traveled a lot of places for work and things like that but none of that has meant more to me than the work that I do with the people that I see every day in the grocery stores and the schools and things like that Thank you also for that question and for the last question as well. Um, I I see it um, a lot in in my community um, in Louisiana, in um, even in the school system, um, minimalizing experiences. Um, you know, one example is after hurricanes. Um, you know, there's FEMA that comes in and asks for how much money do you you make off of the land, how is this impacting you? And, um, and anyone who is not part of the tribe, those who are um, the non the non indigenous people will minimize uh, minimalize um, the subsistence culture and say, oh, they're just they're just trying to get money um, from FEMA or they're just trying to get other things. Um, and and so that is an, a a form of um, a form that you're talking about that happens and a, a, a similar experience that's happening in Guatemala. Um, I think I'll, I'll end it there and I'll let you close. Thank you. I think you're absolutely right and I'm glad you hit on that point that um, being an environmentalist in other parts of the world is very dangerous um, and deeper. And mm -hmm. um, I would just say you know, as the predominant culture and as global globalization is happening, I think we just really have to challenge a lot of our education. And it might be painful to know our history and accept it and know that we are the, you know, we are what's left of it and we have the option to change that. 
um, history has uh, privileged certain parts of our communities and disenfranchised other parts, but I think it's really a matter of self-growth and looking at ourselves with honesty in the mirror. And again, it will be painful, but I think it's worth for the sake of humanity and for our planet to look at ourselves with honesty to see where we can be better. So we've had a lot in this brief 60 minutes together. Um, big questions, big answers, more questions probably than answers, which I think is a good thing. Um, I wanna thank each of our panelists for taking time to be with us today, for sharing your wisdom and your knowledge. And there's a couple things I was writing down as you were talking, um, specifically the idea that environmental justice is the civil rights moment of, of our time, but that we're in this time of such possibility around it, that knowledge is increasing, and that we need to build that capacity of education and knowledge that we have survived this before, we have thrived, and we can continue to survive, and the power of the personal narrative and the collective narrative so I hope that those are some seeds that you all also heard were planted. And again, I just want to honor and acknowledge each of you for your wisdom and experience and your continued contributions to the community and to the earth. Thank you. So we are going to transition into the next panel on sustainability, which uh, Sarah Bexell is going to moderate. Have a minute of transition if you need to get up and stretch your legs. Everyone doesn't mind um, settling back in. We'll get started with our second panel on sustainability. Um, again, my name is Sarah Bexell, and I uh, teach um, in our sustainable development and global practice concentration here uh, at the Graduate School of Social Work. Um, my route here was um, very non-traditional, um, as Jeff alluded to earlier. Um, actually, 20 years of my career went into uh, biodiversity preservation and wildlife conservation. Um, and I treasure that work. I keep a foot, um, sometimes a toe, um, in, in that work. And what brought me to working amongst um, and with and for uh, the field of social work um, was actually seeing steady declines um, at first in other species populations, but then in my work, especially in China over the last 20 years, seeing the threats to the health and well-being of my dearest friends and colleagues um, across the country of China. Um, realizing that mothers were afraid to feed their children because they knew that every bite of food that they took in um, was laden with toxic pesticides. That nobody in that entire country of 1.4 billion people can safely drink the water. And every single breath that they take also is going to shorten their lives. So after working in China for 10 years at the time, I was lucky enough to meet Professor Phil Tedeschi, who's in this room um, today. And at that point in my career, in fighting for, at that time, the lives of other species, I was also realizing that I need to be, needed to be part of the fight um, to protect our own species. And in exchanges with Phil, in starting to learn about social work, I was elated to learn that there are people that know how to work within human systems. Not actually training that I had received at that point in time in my career. So I am thrilled to be a part of this session today. I'm thrilled to be working with an entire team um, of social workers that are um, fighting every single day for environmental justice and for in, um, increasing So with that, I want to turn to our panelists, um, and very briefly, um, we have Professor Chad King, who is the Director of Sustainability for the University of Denver, Jocelyn Durte, who is Senior Regulatory Analyst for the city, uh, State of Colorado, and Councilwoman Candy Sidavaka, um, who is one of your council members. 
And what I would like to do is turn it to you three to briefly introduce yourself and talk a little bit about um, your role in this space. Sure, well, I'll start us off. Um, I am the, dis the city council representative for Denver's District 9, which is home to the zip code 80216. If you're in the environmental justice world, you know that is the most polluted zip code in the country. Um, I was born and raised in Swansea, there in that zip code, three blocks away from I-70. Um, I, my family's been in our district for five generations and was there in the house that I grew up in before I-70 came into the neighborhood and actually fought the first fight to keep it out of the neighborhood. But because we were a historically immigrant community, um, we lost that fight and I picked up where my family left off and my fight against the I-70 expansion uh, snowballed into a run for city council. And so I ran and got elected about seven months ago and. Here I am doing the work of um, a, a generalist, but really catalyzed by my passion and interest in the environmental justice uh, for my community. As Sarah mentioned, my name is Jocelyn Durke. I'm a regulatory analyst at the Colorado Energy Office. We are a state agency under the office of the governor. We have around 30 staff and our mission is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and consumer energy costs by advancing clean energy, energy efficiency, and zero emission vehicles. Uh, in my role, uh, I originally began as a policy analyst in our low income and residential energy unit, uh, which includes an income qualified energy efficiency retrofit program, work in uh, residential buildings, you know, individual single family dwellings and multifamily buildings and then working with other programs such as you know, financing tools to help uh, residential customers uh, of all incomes access energy efficiency and clean energy. A little over a year ago, I moved to a different role uh, working as a regulatory analyst for all of our programs. Our office uh, represents the governor's perspective in regulatory bodies at the state level. So those are bodies where regulations are developed for how to, for example, uh, implement the social cost of carbon when reviewing energy plans, uh, but also to review specific efforts by electric and gas utilities to build new resources, uh, encourage customer adoption of smaller scale renewable energy resources, or look at how transportation electrification uh, can be deployed across uh, utility service territories. For example, Excel Energy is the largest utility here in the state. And so uh, we intervene and work to write and speak testimony in favor of the governor's priorities uh, around clean energy, greenhouse gas emission reductions, and energy efficiency. Um, so uh, I work from a, a pretty high level systems perspective uh, currently um, and also really felt, uh, really appreciated the comments from Dr. Uh, Reyes Mason around interprofessional practice uh, and diverse opportunities for uh, a social work professional identity. I graduated here from GSSW in 2013. Hello, I'm Chad King, uh, the Sustainability Director here at the University. Um, and in my role, I've really been tasked with, uh, the first person in my role was one to create what sustainability is doing, or carry on, what sustainability is happening and what, what that means at the university. Um, I like to sort of frame, in this context, I'd frame what I do around sort of three big areas. Like, in one way, is the, the university is like a small city. And so we have sustainability goals. They translate across a lot of different operational areas. We aim to be carbon neutral by 2050, and we're advancing towards that goal. Uh, but we have the opportunity to be a little bit more flexible probably than a city um, and try new things and really work towards that goal. So it, in that way, I'm sort of working across a lot of the operational areas to get us to, to where we want to be and, and to, to be a model for that in the, in the broader community. Um, I also like to connect my work to the work that really is the work of a university, which is to um, 
educate and to create knowledge. And so I'm always trying to link what they're doing operationally and, and in the curriculum together so that students have a better opportunity to learn. Um, and we can also then work in creating knowledge here on campus and in the community with community partners to move all of our goals forward. Um, so that's, in one sense, that looks like um, operationally I have 45 undergrad inter interns that work on projects all across campus. They're managed by eight graduate students. Um, and they get out into the community as well. And then I run around working with a lot of the other uh, administrators and people all across different areas of campus uh, to move those goals forward. And then lastly, DU prides itself or has a vision of being a private university dedicated to the public good. And I think that directly relates to sustainability and to the work that we're trying to do. So I think we therefore should be living out that vision in our community both as trying to figure out what it means to be an anchor institution. We have a tremendous amount of impact in the community in our spending and in our, um, in our presence and our footprint. Um, so how do we best uh, be intentional about who we are, uh, especially as, we, as it pertains to sustainability and at that intersection with justice? Um, and then how do we work hand in hand to bridge into bigger city and regional projects so that we can actually help partners uh, move forward so that we all are achieving something that is greater than the sum of its parts. And I think the great thing to me in, in terms of trying to, re we've tried to reframe the conversation around sustainability here. And I was going to talk about that, but it was so greatly described already uh, multiple times, especially in the keynote. Um, I felt like a social worker for a second, but I, I'm really an <coughs> environmental scientist by training. Um, but as we reframe that conversation to be more than just talking about diversion rates and waste or kilowatt hour reductions, and we really look at how the underpinnings of sustainability mean that we have to deal with issues of justice, um, I think it changes the conversation and the why, the why we're doing things, and it can bring more people into the conversation and really, uh, and that goes both ways. Uh, so it can bring more people to the justice conversation, more people to the environmental conversation as well. Thank you all so much. So we'll go right into um, our questions. And um, the first one, and maybe we can start with Candy and, and Jocelyn and Chad again. Um, and the first question is, how do you personally define sustainability? And what are the barriers you face in your work in contributing to creating a sustainable human presence? Uh, well, I don't define sustainability um, through the terms of capitalism. I think um, capitalism is really what has led to this structure of unsustainability. And so when I think about sustainability, I think about um, creating ecosystems that don't need much to, to survive. They're, it's leave no mark, leave things better than you found them. Um, and that's not the kind of world that we're living in. And so, for me, a barrier in local government is that we, we like to pride ourselves um, on the things that we're doing. And we talk a lot about what we're doing. We pat each other on the back about all of the great sustainable things that we're doing um, without ever really recognizing how we are part of a structure that upholds um, the unsustainable nature of our existence on this planet and we created this structure to do that and so for me um, the the biggest challenge that i have is getting people to re-envision an alternative structure and doing the work to dismantle what we have while simultaneously recreating something new so i, I this is a, a bit of a challenging question because in, in the systems that I work in, we don't use the terminology of sustainability. Uh, we talk about addressing climate change and we talk about reducing emissions uh, at the state level. And I think that that is important, critical work, but also uh, in my personal perspective, I see that dif excuse me, differently than sustainability. Uh, so they're, they're certainly related and 
and those are components to sustainability. Um, but to to reflect on a, a question and a comment earlier, I, I also want to recognize that institutions um, can be very challenging systems um, to enact change, and that you know this is this is kind of the systems panel. And like, oh, well, some of the systems are great, and we're trying to do things, but um, I want to recognize that that there are challenges that come with that work too. Um, to, to turn to the second part of the question, I think from my perspective, uh, looking at, at the challenges that I face in my daily work around you know, using the terms of reducing emissions and addressing climate change is you know, a fundamental lack of information or a disconnect. Um, the energy system or the electricity system doesn't get noticed when it's doing what it's supposed to do and when everything's working well. And there are times when you know, individuals may have a question around you know, if, if they paid the utility bill on time. And so if you turn on a light, does it work? But generally, you, when you turn on a light switch, you expect it to work and you don't think about it beyond that. And you know, in our work to, to reduce emissions, once you get to, to high levels of emissions reductions, you need a, a really dynamic, flexible system that involves the users. Um, so for example, it will become increasingly important that if you're using electricity around 6 p.m., right now that, that's an emi emitting resource. It's gas or it's coal. And if you use electricity at 1 a.m., it's generally wind. And we've never asked electricity users to pay attention to when they're running you know, their load of laundry or their dishes um, from an emissions perspective, but there's also a price impact to that that customers may experience. And so um, it's, a, it's a pretty complicated discussion to look at how you educate, um, how you incorporate justice and equity and be attentive to what costs people pay in the system and how do you make the emissions reductions that we know are needed uh, to help address climate change. To the first part of the question about how I define sustainability, I, despite the fact that I say the word probably dozens of times a day, I really hate it, uh, because it's become sort of a catch-all that in some ways means nothing, and depending on where you are, it really means nothing, uh, or everything gets lumped into it. Um, and so really I define sustainability, the way I define it, it depends on who I'm talking to because I find that we really need to frame our conversations to our audience many times. And so I like coming at sustainability as rather than, I, I look, I would, rather we look, to, look towards a future of abundance than a future that's sustaining. So how do we talk about a, quality, a future that includes a quality of life for all or a better quality of life for all that includes a a thriving ecosystem with plenty of eco ecosystem services. Um, but depending on who I'm talking about, too, maybe that talking about sustainability is talking about better air quality. Maybe it's talking about better water quality. So I think it, it's best in some ways to frame that conversation. Um, challenges I run into in, in this work, I think, are one, in a university, you may or may not be surprised if you work here, you're not surprised. Um, the places, the university is very fragmented, and so communicating across the university is, is quite com complicated, and it's not uncommon to, I mean, not dissimilar to communicating across um, a city or a broader area. Um, the other thing that we have challenging us is that we have a population that changes every two to four years as students come in and flow out, and so education is a constant. Uh, the great thing, the upside of that, is that 70% of those students do stay around in the area, so that's not great for us our traffic potentially. Um, that does help if we can educate them here. It really, it really helps sort of raise the expectation for what Denver should become. Um, but I think there are yeah, a handful of challenges both around how do we make sure that people understand that sustainability is all of us and it relates to so many different aspects of what we do. Um, but that comes down to can we define it differently for different people so we can all see ourselves and what needs to happen. I'd also just like to expand on that because I think that um, 
the indigenous voice gets forgotten in these conversations. And as a, an indigenous woman myself, it, sustainability isn't the word we use, but the way we approach our life um, with this understanding of our existence impacting seven generations out, that is really, I think, uh, um, an alternative way of understanding sustainability. It's understanding um, the mutually beneficial or symbiotic relationship um, with other people, with your community, with the world, with the planet, um, and and understanding those levels within time as well. <laughs> what was that? How can the profession of social work help in breaking down or alleviating barriers that you face in your work? I feel like I was uh, naturally a social worker before I was um, an environmentalist or in this pursuit of environmental justice because social work under, seeks to understand people in context. And, you know, environmental sociologists or social workers are trying to understand those things that you mentioned about how people take for granted the things that aren't causing problems. They, we don't understand our impact when we flip on a light switch. We're not thinking about those things. And soci social workers are sociologists. They, I think they bring an element to the work that is often missed. So what my, my big barrier when I was trying to build some bridges with environmentalists was helping environmentalists who had some inherent privilege understand that my community, they are also environmentalists but we experience the environment in a different way. And so because we're fighting for environmental justice and fighting against environmental racism, it, it looks different. We're not fighting for open space. We're fighting for clean, healthy, uncontaminated um, living space. And so bridging that gap and bringing that understanding of inequity and the way that um, these structures were, were set up to impact people is what we bring naturally as social workers to the space that I think often gets left out when you're just looking at energy and climate. And so it's that historical context too um, and the understanding of social structures that I think really is our strength as social workers in environmental work. I, I would agree agree with that and then also even from you know where I sit taking a step backwards of, to even have a focus on people um, is a really valuable addition um, to, to my comment earlier around interprofessional practice um, I work mo most of my time is spent with engineers economists um, and you know scientists in general and they provide valuable perspectives and information in the spaces I work. Uh, but you know, to something you'd said earlier was a focus on kilowatt hour uh, components or you know, scientific metrics that, that achieve the energy outcomes in the spaces that I work in. And um, I thought it was really moving. I was at a, a conference uh, about two weeks ago and uh, someone who was there you know, providing perspectives on how these systems can better include equity um, was presenting and talking about how you know, there there's a, a renewed effort at, from states to look at disaster resilience. So how do you adapt to it? How do you mitigate it? And her comment was none of these conversations talk about the fact that like, people are actually the ones who experience um, these disasters, not just humans, but also animals and it, that 
was entirely missing from the conversation. Um, and so I think it's really important just to remind everyone um, that, that we're talking about people and lives. Um, in, kind of, in sharing, you know, it, inspiring um, frameworks and um, to the comment around this being the civil rights movement of our time, I uh, wish I could recall who to attribute the quote to, but I had heard recently uh, that climate change is what we're going to do to each other. And I found that to be a really impactful comment um, and something that I constantly work to remind myself of, that you know, there are kilowatt hours and megawatts um, and people that I'm working with. I really second the, the concept of social workers um, emphasizing and bringing to light the social structures that really have led to unsustainability um, and their impacts on people. And I think as we, I appreciated the comparison earlier of the grand challenges in social work to the grand challenges in engineering. Um, I think different disciplines have a lot to learn from sort of a human-centered, empathetic approach to problem solving and understanding the people and the framework that a person's coming from in order to, to come to a solution that's a solution for everyone. And then I think the other piece that's really critical when we tried to reframe sustainability work here as working towards a just and sustainable future. In that, in a future that's that's truly just, everyone has a voice in the decision making that impacts them. And I think social work brings that piece to the, to the forefront of how do we provide voice to people, um, especially in the planning processes. And I, just one example of how we use working at this, I mean, we've been involved in some projects that use photo voice in city planning processes around street design or transportation projects. So how do we really hear from community members, especially those that might be sort of have their voices drowned out in, in other other uh, forms of communication? How do we really bring that communication to the forefront and get it in front of, of decision makers? So I think the voices is really important. Thank you. And our final speaker for I'm going to keep harping on it because this is what I do. The, our economic structure is really what causes us or is the impetus for this environmental terrorism that we're participating in. We have a structure that is, is designed to exploit land, labor, or resources in order to generate profit. And we've learned... Um, how to define cost in this particular way. And so unlearning what we know about cost, I think is the important thing, the most important thing of our time. Because something is cheaper or more convenient in the short term, doesn't mean that it's actually a lower cost in the long term. The cost of something, uh, the cost of our immediate actions on our environment in the long term is what we need to start wrapping our head around. And I think that's the hardest thing for people to do because we've gotten to a place in our society where we're about that immediate instant gratification um, at the cheapest cost. Um, and so flipping the paradigm around our understanding of cost is I think the most important. It's been very exciting this afternoon to, to hear from everyone around their different roles and their uh, respective work. And so I, I see myself as you know, one little person in a, in a very large effort around uh, sustainability, climate change, and, and equity. And so I think you know, only speaking to me specifically, you know, the part that I'm working on it, you know, in the state is to reduce emissions and address climate change, and I, I see that as one part in a broad effort. So. Well, I, 
agree with all the others. I think to get to some of those next steps, I think we need to figure out ways to really bring together a diverse and creative set of problem solvers to look at this all in a new way. So how do we, how do we jump to another level of sustainability? How do we break out of slow incremental changes, but really radically redesign some of the operational systems that we work under or the infrastructure that we've built, the way we learn. Um, so how can we bring people together into sort of a new space and keep that space sort of sacred for them to work in to create the, the new and, the, and a sustainable future. And our final question uh, for our panelists today, um, in the planning committee, we um, really wanted everybody to go home feeling hopeful and having some action strategies. Um, Dr. Mason shared with us today some pretty grim statistics that maybe make us feel a little uncomfortable. Um, and so what we would love to hear from all three of you are some strategies, um, keeping in mind that we have students, we have faculty members, we have community members, um, community partners in the room, and what are three strategies that we could all take part in um, to combat some of these sustainability challenges? I'm not going first this time. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> In consistent with some of the other comments, I, I think um, to me a strategy is really being participatory in your community. Um, it could be voting, it could be filing comments, it could be protesting. Um, I, you know, it, as someone kind of inside the system, um, I can personally say that the people notice and they listen uh, and they listen to the voices that make demands or set expectations or communicate what's important. Uh, it, working for our current governor, uh, he ran on a platform to address climate change and reduce emissions, and that's incredibly important that he was voted in as part of that being his platform. I think that uh, I'd also add that a, a disproportionate amount of attention uh, gets directed federally, in my opinion, uh, local and state systems uh, touch your everyday lives much more and so um, there are many levels um, that you can speak towards um, and I can promise that I'm listening at least um, I don't know how reassuring that may or may not be um, I think I would also a second strategy is keep discussing equity uh, and justice you know the natural course of many systems and institutions you know, is where we currently are, which is not one of equality and you know, not one of justice. And you know, climate change is a significant variable um, that in, in my opinion is only going to make you know, justice work both more challenging and more important. And so prioritizing justice to institutions uh, is really important to, to have them think about not just the natural course of business, but how can they do better. Um, and my third takeaway, uh, I think could work for everyone, but is really meant for current students. Um, I can recall when I was here, I had so much passion and energy and I was so excited to get out and do things. Um, and it's, it's incredibly important to have that fire. And I remember hearing uh, professors and advisors talking about like, be very cognizant of burnout and how you keep going. And I just remember being so passionate. I'm like, that, well, that doesn't really matter to me. Um, and I can say that you know, seven years in, um, that's very relevant. Uh, statement and so I think as you're thinking about how what your passion is and how you want to direct it think about how you can sustain it um, you know, to the idea of whether or not your youth um, my retirement portfolio projections conveniently line up close to when like the IPCC um, international body of climate change targets uh, are directing emissions reductions so as everyone's talking about 2050 efforts I'm I can understand what 2050 looks like in terms of my life. Um, and so I, I've recently been 
thinking a lot around like how do I keep my passion and my fire going by 2050. Um, so that, that's one that I would direct uh, as a third strategy is making sure that, that you're sustaining yourself and your energy uh, to keep the fire going. I guess I'd have some sort of layered recommendations on, on uh, activity. One, I would think, is to, to talk to people. Um, I think sustainability and climate change has been politicized in ways that it really, I, I don't understand how it can be. How can we be against clean air? How can we be against clean water? How can we be against a better quality of life for everyone? Um, so I think if we can talk across the divides, we can sort of avoid that burnout support each other in this work. Um, I think we each have individual responsibilities that we can we can take action on, um, whether that's the, the small things of trying out a different mode of transportation to relieve the pressure on our streets if we're able, or whether that's um, buying something that supports, that maybe is of a higher cost to support our local economy or a local farmer or a local um, women or minority owned business in a way that we hadn't thought about before. But I also don't want to, uh, I, I don't think we can put all the pressure on the individual either because this is a systemic issue. So how do we then, I think we then need to also work at the systems, whether that's big institutions or whether that's at the state level or whether that's uh, pushing for city change. I think that's where we all need to, it's, or, or even asking our companies to change how they do practices by voting with their dollar. Um, we need to push at the systems too it's you can't just have it all be pushed down on individuals that's not how we got here I agree with all of that and I'm going to give you a real social worky answer um, because I think a lot of the big work starts with the inner work and to change our actions we have to change our thoughts so we need to do a little bit of our own cognitive behavioral therapy uh, for ourselves and so I think one of the first things that we need to do um, and, and, I, and I'm understanding my audience here, this is a predominantly white room, um, is recognize and honor ancestral wisdom. Sustainability does not belong to white people. In fact, your ancestors may have participated actively in erasure of sustainable practices through colonization. And we have to, we have to deal with that because um, the second thing I think we need to do is understand our privilege to focus on sustainability. When we, when we condemn other people for not recycling or composting, when you have people who are living in super fun sites, working two and three jobs to make ends meet and are lucky to have food, let alone think about what, what to do with throwing away the leftovers you have very different worlds that you're dealing with. And so recognizing your privilege um, and your ancestral impact um, in the predicament we're in is really important. I also think that we have to just start accepting the inconvenient. We have to get used to knowing that the, the right thing to do is gonna be the harder thing to do. Um, and that's not just with our daily practices, it's with dismantling these very big structures. It's nice to focus on how recycling is important or turning the light off in our house is important, but we have to also participate in making sure that our biggest waste generators in the city of Denver, our, waste, our residential waste is only about 14% of total waste. 50% of that waste is from construction and demolition, and nobody is fighting to make sure that construction and demolition are engaging in more sustainable practices. And so getting, being truly about sustainability means getting involved at a different level than you're already involved in, and going beyond your own household to, to engage in dismantling this bigger system that is more destructive than anything. Um, and really relies on us not focusing on the system. It relies on us focusing on our individual practices and patting ourselves on the back for composting. Um, we have to do more and we have to accept that, that it is going to be hard and inconvenient. 
And so those are the three things that I would say we need to do within ourselves. The organizer part of this would say, pick five people that you teach to do these three things and hold them accountable and help hold you accountable. I guess the, the word urgency comes to mind. No one needs to be freaked out, and yet we have to sense urgency here. And so two thoughts I, I'm curious about. Economic levers to move things forward. I'm thinking of, uh, I consulted Google. Apparently, Denver University has uh, 760 some in an endowment fund. Have we talked about divestment is some of that money tied up in fossil fuel companies? And Denver, I understand, borrows a billion dollars from Chase um, to finance operations and pays interest to Chase, which goes to Wall Street. And they've got a pretty crappy record in terms of investing in fossil fuels. So I'm wondering if there's some economic levers. I mean, they're personal things, but you're right. It's a systems issue. And one other thought, why do we keep talking about 2050? That's the, that's the date Excel talks about. Is that giving us a, a sense of maybe less urgency if we have more time? Do we need to be realizing things change, but can't things move faster? I mean, isn't it realistic not to get fixated on 2050? I love that question. <laughs> um, because it's all about the economic levers, right? When we talk about um, the, the system of capitalism feeding this beast, um, and switching to a new paradigm, we don't have to borrow from Wall Street, we don't have to borrow from Chase, but that requires us shifting the way that we meet our needs as a city or a state. Public banks, um, those are ways to eliminate that, that middleman that we borrow from, that investment in these fossil, these bad industries. But it goes beyond that. If we're talking about public banking, we also need to be talking about real intervention in market failures. We talk about Excel and accept that there's only one energy provider here. When we go to school all our lives and are told that that's a market failure, that's a monopoly, but there's no intervention, we normalize it. And we let a company that's making money off of these practices tell us our timeline and tell us what's possible. Well, of course, because it's on their timeline and they're the only ones who we can get it from. So the reason we get stuck with 2050 and what is possible according to Excel is because we let that, we let that happen. We have a public utilities commission where we pick one person and one company and let them set the terms. And so we have to really start thinking about undoing that structure too because we will always let a corporation making money off of bad practices dictate our terms if we don't change the structure. I agree with the urgency need. Um, I think the 2050 question or date came from early science, 2030 is the newest date um, that we really need to be targeting on, on carbon neutrality or getting closer or as close as we can to that. Um, in terms of bigger institutional like levers, uh, we have looked at um, divestment. Um, we haven't been able to move uh, senior administration or, or the board of trustees on that. Um, it's complicated is one of the answers um, because of how we invest in fluid investments. Um, but I will say one of the things that DU has done that I was, I, I'm always proud to share, we, we finally got intentional about how we're spending our money locally. Um, in this past year, we're building three buildings right now. You might have noticed uh, in the traffic and the mud. Um, for the first time, we set goals for our spend towards local women and minority veteran-owned companies. Um, prior to doing this, other buildings we'd seen a spend of about 4% towards those, those groups. Um, and this, this year on these three buildings, we were able to put $30 million into um, that, our sort of our targeted intentional spend. 
um, with those companies, uh, mostly through the contracting work that's being done, which that's up to 30% on some of those buildings. So there are these steps that are small, but um, yes, the urgency is there. Nobody wants to make a donor mad who made their fortune off of gas and oil, right? And building off of that with urgency, there was a, a Westward article that came out, I believe today, if not it was yesterday, and it was an analysis looking at uh, you know, what is the, the essentially business as usual with the current state's climate policies and efforts, and where does that get us in terms of long-term emission reductions and unsurprisingly there's a really significant gap um, and so you know the the actions you have today in terms of the utility space of building a resource you know, that resource is there for 30 to 80 years um, so urgency is absolutely important um, in terms of our work around timelines and framing at the state to uh, to build on what Chad had said um, we are working off of legislation passed in the previous, uh, in the 2019 session that sets goals for 25% uh, of a greenhouse gas emissions reduced by 2026, 50% by 2030, and 90% by 2050. Um, and so we are much more concerned around 2026. That's, that's very soon. Um, and so that it isn't about pushing it off to, to 2050. Um, it, we have very important work we need to be um, in terms of the economic levers component, um, I think you, from a from a standpoint of someone who's working in systems and and status quo in those systems, um, many decisions, you know, to your point about economics, are based on a very traditional cost benefit argument um, that's increasingly irrelevant when you're only looking at um, the immediate costs and the immediate benefits. Um, the state's just beginning to incorporate health impacts um, and you know these non-energy benefits around air quality. Um, another really significant uh, cost that is felt in a different environment is uh, we're in a serious status of air quality non-attainment uh, in the metro area. And uh, it's my understanding that in 2022, there's going to be serious economic consequences from non-compliance and, and that doesn't show up in a traditional cost-benefit equation but it's certainly uh, very important to look at. Meanwhile we're expanding highways that are going to put us further out of compliance um, and we were allowed to do that because we engineered modeling to tell us that we would stay under it and so we've got to push harder when somebody's proposing an expansion in your neighborhood of any kind of road to say, no, that's not a, a way we want to spend our money because the I-70 expansion is our most expensive infrastructure project in our history as a state. And it is probably the most environmentally disastrous of our time as well. Hi, um, my question is for Ms. Cedavac. It actually is about the highway expansion. Um, I agree that it is a one of the stranger decisions. I've lived in Colorado my whole life and continue to be not shocked but saddened that that um, is the direction of the highway expansion. I'm curious. The um, there was a question earlier about like invisibilizing. <laughs> Uh, parts of the community and the Swansea Illyria community really stands out as, to me as a community that has been um, invisibilized. There, you know, there's been a few articles in the Denver Post or some, you know, talks on CPR about um, local people's response to the highway expansion, but I don't feel like it has been um, as widely talked about as I would hope. I have some interns that are at GSSW right now who didn't had never heard of the Swansea Illyria neighborhood um, and were unfamiliar with the I-70 expansion. So my question is, first off, how, what updates are there or what, um, what are people saying? What are local people in that community saying now at this point as the expansion continues? Um, and what, what can the community at large do at this point to be more involved in that expansion? Well, I'm really glad I'm sitting next to the governor's uh, Jocelyn here because it's really in the governor's hands right now. You know, we've 
filed lawsuits at every level. We've sued the Federal Highway Administration, we sued the state, we sued the city, um, and spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on doing so. And we did that as a small, marginalized community. Uh, we, you say invisibilized, we say sacrificed. Um, and we've been trying to bring attention to this for over five years. Um, the conversation went on for a decade leading up to the decision. And we were consistently trying to get our message out there, but the, the sacrificed element uh, is, is really about how the, the media shapes the narrative, right? The, everybody knew that there was a highway coming through a neighborhood. The, everybody knew we were the most polluted zip code in America. Everybody knew we were poor. Everybody knew we were brown. But the value in exchange for that was worth it, right? Getting to work five minutes faster if you believed that this was solving a congestion issue was more important to you than the human impact or the environmental impact. And so we, it was very hard for us to change that narrative because we, we didn't have the power of the media. It took a lot of um, outside national sources coming in to even get coverage of the story and what was going on and so right now, community has not given up. We still have a very active body um, of organized community members that is pleading uh, to the governor to reopen this, to reassess um, the modeling, to have the, have the health impact assessment updated. And we haven't really had much response. Um, so we're really counting on outsiders to say, hey, you come to the voters, every couple of years asking for more money for transportation infrastructure and you're dumping all of our money into a project that's not solving our issues, what's going on? We need some better leadership here. We need some, we need you all to do something that will restore our confidence in giving you money to meet our infrastructure needs. So it's up to everyone in this room to leave this room today and call the governor and say, Look at I-70. If you care about the environment, this is your one opportunity to leave a lasting mark and to undo something that will have generations of impact. I can offer to share my contact information. I, I'm very unfamiliar with that, you know, the nuances of that project, so I can't really speak to it, but um, I can help pass along. Thank you. I want to shift this just slightly because I live in this neighborhood. I've been here for 27 years. And when I first, and I walk a lot, and when I first moved here, I could walk down the walking path and there were crab apple trees that when you would walk by them in the spring, there would be so many bees that the whole tree sounded a bit as if it was, were buzzing. I walk by now and I barely see a half a dozen bees in one of those trees. And DU has a large footprint here, and I've watched it grow in the last 27 years. And you have a lot of lawns here. And when I walk by here in the springtime, you, you want to talk about emissions are from the, the herbicides or pesticides and things that you use on your lawns here. Yet you, I walk around through the campus, which I'm very happy to have the hospitality extended for me to be able to do that, and you have no smoking signs, you cannot smoke on the campus. Yet the things that migrate off the campus into the water and the air and kill the bees and, and Jocelyn, you talked about the animal aspect of this. And I think that's a big part of sustainability and emissions and what is DU going to do about this in terms of what you do with your lawns? That's something that actually it's timely. We're launching a uh, a sustainable landscape um, guide for campus moving forward. Um, so we have been working mostly around the edges um, of campus to try to change how we operate. Um, we have about 30 acres of grass that uh, we'd like to keep chipping away at. We have goals of reducing the amount of grass that we have, um, mostly from a, a water standpoint. 
And we really have just, and we've just rolled out to uh, sort of formalizing our operations on an integrated pest management plan, which looks at all the alternatives to pesticides before we go there. So we try to reduce that amount and limit the amount of, of actual uh, pesticide herbicide treatment we, we use. Um, so I think there's a changing perception on what a campus can look like, and that's happening at DU um, as different landscapes are, are, more, are becoming valued and, and appreciated in different ways. So it's, it's a changing perception. Um, I think you'll be seeing some changes coming over the next couple of years. Wonderful. Well, this um, concludes, I think we went a few minutes over. Um, and so let's please um, give a round of applause for our second panel on this Thank you so much, Chad and Jocelyn and Candy. And if you would like to stay and relax, what we can enjoy now um, is final So I've been asked to, uh, you can hear me? Yes? Okay, great. Um, just kind of reflect on thoughts from this afternoon together. Um, and so you'll just, there's four themes that I've kind of uh, drawn out of many possible things that have come up in this very um, hard, as you said, some of the statistics, uh, challenging, provocative, I think, um, conversations that we have. So the first is on connection, an interconnection. Of course, the connections that we all need to be making uh, across disciplines, across sectors, the academy, the, the community. Um, also, I heard a theme around generations, around children, youth, youth who are in their 40s, people who are in between their 40s and elders, whatever that might mean in your community, and then elders. And so the need to connect in this work across generations of people, and then also to interconnect. Thinking about the non-human, thinking about the living and the non-living. Um, Leah Prussia, who is an indigenous scholar, also an educator working in this work. Um, I, I'm guess, guessing, this isn't her phrase, but at, at our environmental justice meetings in, in Alexandria. Uh, she talks about the, um, the wingeds, the four-leggeds, the crawlers, the swimmers. So thinking about all of the connections of, of uh, our world. And Joe Cordova, before he left, one of the things he talked about was how without everyone, we can't get to the goal. So everybody here, everybody online, everybody has a goal. A second theme that I heard was about voice. Voices being heard by people in power, but critically, those voices becoming the ones who are in power. And I think Councilperson Sikibaka exemplifies this, um, being here today and sharing with us. I'm not, I'm not from here, so I don't, you know, I'm gonna be from here soon, um, in a few months, but uh, Councilperson Sikibaka shared with us her own personal narrative her family, her community's experience of living with environmental injustice every day. And now that is clearly a compelling, vibrant voice um, around justice, all kinds of justice, including environmental justice. A third theme that I heard was, uh, was really, I was trying to think of what the good phrase is for it. I think it's really around radical degrowth. It's this questioning of capitalism, of consumption, of yes, we need to all do those individual actions, but we need to also go beyond that radically. And uh, I think this resonates with what Beatriz Soto was saying when she, she said, looking in the mirror. We all need to look in the mirror and ask ourselves, how do we do better? And then the fourth one is, is about action title of this series, um, Science Into Action, but it's, it's, it's way bigger than that. It's way bigger than just the science into action part. It's about all of the individual actions, the bigger radical actions, the challenging actions, um, living out our values through our actions, turning our hopes. That was a theme we said that the committee hoped for. So turning each of our hopes 
for a better world, turning that into actual action after each of us who's here today and everybody online and everybody who will stream, watch the online later, will hopefully do. So dreaming big, showing up, and then doing the work of all of these different actions. Um, so those are my thoughts on what I heard this afternoon today. Thank you again to everybody who had a role in organizing this. Um, and thank you to all of you for attending and to everybody who's online uh, watching. Um, thank you so much. And we hope that you will stay for a few more minutes to just have more conversation, have more um, uh, refreshments, and